Go ahead, Tracy. No, I was just going to say, I've seen the entire uh, Smiley Face Killers documentary, and that was just absolutely awesome. And as I know from editing video, it's a monumental task. So that was, I just got to say, you know, hats off for for putting all that stuff together. I mean, thank you. pretty sure you're the only one who's compiled all that information all in one place. I think and, so. <laughs> I don't so think do want- anybody is like pseudo autistic enough to do something as crazy as compile three and a half hours of information. But that was kind of. It's, it's terrific. <laughs> I need. I need to um, hold on a sec. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not trying to take over your show, Sean. You want to? You want to no, ask no, the, the introductory I, questions and whatnot? We're totally casual. I'm really glad to start with that because I feel like that's um, just the other day. William, I shared uh, just one of the updates. I think it's one that's in progress. I don't remember the name. And I got quite a bit of pull on Facebook just from my friends and family, and it makes me feel good when you're doing something that at the minimum builds awareness because the smiley face killers phenomenon is a horrible thing, and it's not something we can talk about in the past tense, unfortunately, and there's people still at risk. So, folks, if you're not aware um, of the fact that the the what looks like ritual killings they're they're still going on and it's worth it to let especially college age men know to point them in william's direction and let them get a catch a heads up because it's something that's happening so that you know it's horrible but i'd much rather uh, be in a position to know about it and share as opposed to um people being more at risk because it's shocking it's you know it's a really shocking excellent point excellent point so uh, can i ask something like um i know you're kind of more broadly, uh, an investigator of all sorts of occult things. When did you get started with that stuff, and what would you say is the first topic you really delved into? Well, I would say I was always a person who was willing, even like before the advent of like media, of the internet media, I was always willing to read alternate sources of information that were not corporate or state-influenced sources of media. So even before the internet, I was reading stuff about JFK, alternate subject, never a public person, but really my first book was Prophet of Evil, which was really about Aleister Crowley, his ideology and its influence on the events of 9-11 through numerology, but also the referential meaning of that numerology. So that was really where I, my research, just personal research, like I read a lot. I don't watch sports or anything like that. Um, Mm -hmm. So it leaves a lot of free time to just kind of sit around and and troll the internet. But I was always curious about the events of 9-11. And that's kind of what led me into the occult. And it was because I think I've learned over the last 10 years, looking at a deeper level of any topic, there's a lot more to these stories that even the journalists and other people, whether their biases or their sensibilities do not want to look deeper into these subjects, prevent them from, I think, seeing the broader meanings of truth. And so that was really it. I would say I got labeled as an occult expert, um, you know, I wasn't in the self-styled label at all, but it just seemed to be stories that I was willing to tell that nobody else seemed to either, for one reason or another, didn't want to talk about. So that was a Aleister Crowley, then the West Memphis Three Ritual Murders, then the history of Aleister Crowley through the 20th century, through people like Timothy Leary and Jimmy Page and all that. And then it was really through that book, the, the my research into Alan Moore, and his references of Crowley in From uh, Hell and The Watchmen was The Smiley Face. So that's where I started to make that tie because I heard about The Smiley Face killings. There have been journalists talking about it. And for people who don't know, the, really the, the way it got its name was there were two detectives in New York, Gannon and, Gil, uh, Gannon and Duarte, who uh, covered were really the, one of the first known cases, a guy by the name of McNeil in 1997. And there was another professor who was in Wisconsin, his name is Gilbertson. So they kind of met up actually because they saw the similar pattern and they labeled these killings of college age men who have disappeared and then found in water, typically longer than they should have been found. Typically a body will float um, three, four days, even in colder water. But uh, they labeled it the smiley face killers because of the prevalence or the appearance of this smiley face that is, is, typically where they think the body was put in water, not where the body was found. So uh, somewhere around there, it's been a spray painted 
smiley face in a lot of these deaths. So that's kind of how that whole pattern of me studying Crowley led me to making the documentary. I had no contact with either Gilbertson or Gannon or anybody associated with that. And they just came out with a really superb six part series on oxygen that uh, came out in December. So I was really pleased to see that. Oh, good, good. Superb job. Yeah. So anyway. now, I, I want to ask you about this. Uh, there's this mockumentary that is on YouTube and it won some uh, awards at Cannes. And so when you look on YouTube for stuff about smiley face killers, this is the first thing it presents you. And since it's a full movie, you know, someone who doesn't know much about the subject will just end up watching this whole thing. And I looked at the comments. People cannot tell that this thing is fake, or at least half of them can't. And then the other half, when they see that it's fake, they think, oh, the whole thing is fake. The whole subject is fake. Right. What what do you you think about that? uh, That's I'm glad you brought that up because very other there's many other subjects, maybe Crowley, where there's so many different opinions and people hiding truths about Crowley that this case is these cases are very similar. Why are there cul-de-sacs? Why are there dead ends? Why are people manipulating facts about these cases? Why are they trying to debunk it? Um, so uh, that movie's had a lot of influence. A lot of people have watched it. And like you said, it's a 50-50 choice be- between whether they figure out. Nobody in that documentary is real. Nobody there is associated with any of the families or anything. So why did somebody make it? And then there's a, but the, the subject has elicited interest in Hollywood and in people, creative people who are making stuff. Because right now there's a project that's being filmed by the guy who wrote American Psycho, Brett Easton Ellis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, and it's based on the smile of the killers. And I know somebody or something that came to my attention that the production is happening somewhere in the Midwest. And it's, I think, Crispin Glover is in it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. uh, Yeah. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And I've never had any contact with any of those people at all. I mean, but if people have seen my documentary, it's done better than I expected. But, uh, you know, one of the chief complaints is it's too long. But I had a ton of information. The strange, crazy thing is I could have gone seven hours. But yeah, yeah. I just really, I was really just trying to push people's understanding forward because they're looking through the lens of Gilbert and Gannon, which is good, but it's much broader than they've said publicly. And I know they're keeping their cards close to their chest. They're not telling the full story. They've made statements in their in their most recent series that. There's 11 other additional symbols that they found associated with these deaths. And there's, so hmm. um, I think that my documentary was trying to just, and Jim Smith was my, my chief doc, uh, researcher. And I actually think that he's the most important. I've come to this conclusion. I didn't have it, but it's uh, smiley face cold is his tag on Twitter. But I think he's actually the most important researcher on the subject, even more, and it's a probably a bold statement over Gannon and Gilbertson, who really are the original kind of guys. But I think what Jim Smith has done is really broaden understanding, particularly mine, about the, the global nature of this phenomenon because it's happening in the UK. There's cases in Germany, one Liam Colgan, Scotland, France, Vienna. I had one in Thailand in the movie. So I think that if I had a critique of Gannon, Gilbertson, and Duarte, it would be... And, and the production, I mean, they were produced by Blumhouse Predic- Productions, which is a uh, kind of a well-known horror kind of genre production company. So they had backing of some legit people. But I think one of their, if I critique them, it would be that they didn't, they haven't, they haven't seen the broader picture or reported it. I think they know the gravity and the seriousness of these deaths, but they haven't publicly stated so that's an unfortunate thing for me do you think that's just trying to keep from sounding too crazy when you're talking about it or i think that might be it i think that some people aren't asking the right questions i don't think i think that there's other people who have debunked this uh tried to debunk what's known as the smiley face killers and it's a half misnomer the title not all of these deaths have this Tattoo, and I wouldn't, in even my documentary, I didn't des- describe the deaths to one individual. But, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, 
I think that there's a lot of people trying to debunk. And I actually made a video two weeks ago on my YouTube channel. I would recommend you and your listeners watch, which was titled Debunking the Fake Debunkers or the Failed Debunkers, because there were two documents. One was by study for homicide, Center for Homicide that supposedly debunked the cases, and then another one. And I just took I I just analyzed them and showed that there's so many more cases. There's two to three hundred cases of these young men disappearing and being found in water that um, the phenomenon without question is happening. Yeah, and, the, uh, I gotta anyway. I gotta um, say there, Bill, that uh, oh, it's a pattern that um, I've seen. I've I've been doing you know kind of same as you said, not real big on TV. You know, lots of reading, lots of conspiracy research for a long time, twenty years at least, probably more. <laughs> And uh, I uh, actually did an interview with a man named Jesse Waugh called Paralleling, uh, was the subject of the same thing, where the, somebody's coming out with what seems like really honest, um, pertinent information, shocking, taboo, or controversial in nature, usually occult, you know. Um, and um, they, they'll come out with a similar or almost identical story. They'll even put a person up that looks similar to the original researcher. They'll put out debunking and uh, misleading dead-end paths. And uh, when Tracy told me about this second documentary, I thought this is a huge, a huge example of someone paralleling off of uh, yours and other people's research um, and leading them to, like, it's... They almost want people to acknowledge that something exists, like, okay, I see it, I know it, you know, then then it kind of goes away and they don't keep looking into it. And um, so I, I want to remind people, too, the link is in the description to, to find William Ramsey, and there's a link there to buy the documentary. And, of course, we encourage you to do that. Um, if you haven't seen it, I didn't catch the whole thing, but uh, I've been following you and the work for a while. But I think well, that you guys I'm, are definitely I'm, over -targeted. I'm glad you ma Yeah, I'm glad you made that point because... There was something that happened that I just analyzed, which was the Hampstead, Hampstead SRA case. And Hampstead Heath, yeah. Hampstead Heath, and I, <clears throat> I didn't really know what to make of the two young kids, but I reanalyzed it after all these years. And <laughs> to me, it's a hoax. And it was something that was put together that to make it sound believable, right? They had all the SRA elements. They were talking the same language. There was child abuse. There were so-called rituals. But when I really looked into it, it was it was fake, and it's a real concern because some of these people are based are discounting, like you said, discounting real phenomenon by referencing hoaxes or fake stories or fake narratives, and then saying that extrapolates into the t entirety of the phenomenon, which is a, a logical fallacy. But still, uh, that is happening. Um, that, like you said, the, these fake stories are definitely being proffered by people for either profit. There's, I, mean, I think half of the half of the UFO community is hoax, at least half. Yeah, yeah. And th there's tons of money being made by these people. So um, that's one one subject matter, whether it's Satanism, parapolitics, UFOs, where all of them have that problem of hoaxers who really are informational snake oil salesmen. So, and it's happened in this Smiley Face Killers as well. In, the, in that documentary, the, or the, excuse me, the fake mockumentary, one of the elements that it has in it, which I just, I, I couldn't believe they were being this blatant about setting the kind of trap that we're talking about. But the person who's the main uh, investigator in that story, in that fictional story, uh, it comes out that um, he was faking a lot of the evidence and then at the end he's kind of saying well i was doing it to try to you know, get people to believe it or you know to get them to take it seriously but so the researcher gets debunked in the fictional documentary as being a hoaxer himself so right. i mean Interesting. Great imagine point, that yeah. that's you that they're pretend that's basically this is someone standing in as you trying to represent you to people that haven't seen your actual work yet so that when they hear about you later, that's what they're going to think about. That's just what I, I imagined because no, you're, you're the, the you're the go-to expert on this subject. And so who else are they portraying but you? That movie has had tons of views. I, the last time I checked, it's over a million. So somebody's clicking on it, you know, and I always feel those questions, whether it's real or not. So it might even be what's really scary is that might be the most referenced film and, and document over all the subjects of anything involving what's known as the Smiley Face Killers. It's scary. It is because, yeah, if it's 
if it is real, which, you know, we all believe it is, um, everyone who's talking uh, at the moment, well, it's very dangerous then to uh, throw people off the trail there. Right. With something that's yeah. serious because people actually, this is, this is something that's ongoing, uh, still a threat to young men. And what, you, what you've been describing about how these guys are being slipped roofies, basically, right. usually, usually that's how it seems to start. Uh, well, that's something that guys aren't looking out for, and they should. Right. But only if they would have heard a story like this would they even think about it. Great point. Absolutely. So I think the predators who are out there are had that advantage. So I think that it's important to get the word out. I think it's kind of creeping into the consciousness with greater presence than any time in the past now because of this new documentary. And also, there are just more people are involved in the story. And for people who don't know, there's probably 10 armchair researchers like me who are, have massive spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets with names, dates, circumstances, and they're looking through all these cases. And, you know, the numbers are off the charts. Nobody wants to really publish their findings, which you can't really blame because people could misuse it. But there's a lot of people working on it now that I, would, I can't disclose, but it's uh, there's a lot of things happening outside of the public purview. And more really, just to reference the oxygen thing with Gannon Gilbertson and Duarte, they had the more case that I followed. So when really when I really started researching was probably 2016. The first case I followed where I followed a man who disappeared and then was found in water, water was Joey LeBute out of Columbus, Ohio. And he was on Grinder. And I said, if this guy gets found in water, I'm going to freak out. He was found in water in the Scioto River. But one of the main cases that I really researched was a guy by the name of Dakota James, another young gay guy on a gay, gay dating app in Pittsburgh, PA. And they featured him in that documentary, uh, sorry, in that Oxygen series. And they did an hour-long story. And it involved really one of the primary medical examiners, not just for the Smiley Face Killers, but for the U.S., a guy that most people are familiar with. His name is Cyril Wecht. And uh, he uh, was the first guy to read the uh, medical examination report of McNeil in New York, but he also read Dakota James's and found that the medical examiner, the original medical examiner, whose name is Chinese guy, who not even an American, bungled the medical exam because Cyril Weck found ligature marks on the neck of Dakota James. And his body was, uh, it wasn't in the water for 40 days, according to Cyril Weck. So then, then when the mother of Dakota James went to go talk to the DA, uh, she said that member somebody from the FBI and somebody from the Secret Service was there as well. So, wow, very important development, and that's you know that just came out three months ago. So, somebody else was looking into it. So, uh, just for the sake of telling the audience, what is it you think that's uh, going on when these guys are missing for several weeks before their bodies show up? Well, I think they're being abducted. I think that they're being targeted, and they're either being targeted through gay apps or just at the local bar. And, and these aren't all gay guys, just some of them, but I'm there's told, like a gay element to the attack, right? That's, that's my general belief. I mean, I think if you look at the motiv- a general motivation for crimes, money, violence, sex, this is the sex. You know, that's what I believe that that's really the primary. None of these guys have ever had their card stolen. There's never been a ransom note. Um, and it doesn't seem, I mean, the viol- I think the violence is an aspect of it, but... Uh, I really think that they're targeted because they're all basically fit the athletic skinny profile. Like they did a show that the guys who did the oxygen show were recently on two really important big shows, Dr. Phil and uh, Oz, the Dr. Oz. So you can see those online where they're like, you know, giving their information. Unfortunately, it's full of sound bites and uh, cutaways to advertisement. But in that Gilbertson got up and looked, took the BMI the body mass index, average American, average male. And all of these guys are like off the chart. They're, they're not in the center mean. They're off of t- the other side of the bell curve where they're more skinny and slight than, uh, than the average af- like uh, muscular male maybe. So that was an interesting point. So that's why I think they're targeted. There was a very interesting article that just came out in the Daily Beast by Somebody who's been following the case for a long time. Her name is last name is Egan, E G A N, Daily Beast, and she uh, got information from Dakota James's friend that he actually 
had been drugged five weeks before he disappeared. And he was at a hotel and called her and said, I don't know where I am, come help me. So there's other aspects of this where these people may be selected or targeted for one reason or another. So I think so the answer your question, they, primary they, motivation they, is, yeah. So yeah. Sorry. Oh, no. The primary motivation is sex, you're saying? Yeah, that's what I think. I think that that's, and that's probably why people are confused about the phenomenon because it's within a subset of the larger hetero community that doesn't understand, you know, the homosexual community. With, and then, then an even subset of that, which is BDSM, gift yeah. masks, uh, uh, GHB, Right, um, uh, pop, pop, poppers and all that kind of stuff. Too. Yeah, right, exactly. In chem the sex, chem sex, yeah. chem sex. I don't even know that one. <laughs> so you were just crazy. using drugs? Never heard of. Uh, the, the, there's definitely the drug poppers has been popular for years in gas stations, and that you huff it during sex. And you know, I just know that because I, I mean, like, like William said, you know, I've. I've uh, I've known a lot of uh, gay people. I was a rock and roll musician, so like you get more insight into someone's actual lifestyle when you're around them and exposed to them. And poppers is like an inhalant, and they'll inhale it uh, during uh, you know the whole intercourse process, whatever they're doing. It's just like accoutrement to to some gay sex, you know. So that's and GHB actually is used as a date rape drug, but it's also used as a stimulant for in yep. certain, certain parts of that community in my yeah, documentary I covered just Stephen Fort, for sure, who, yeah. uh, is a grinder serial killer and it was covered in a book by warren who i interviewed and he was involved with tons of ghb and he was said he was involved in these parties where they would meet up on gay apps and just do a bunch of drugs and have sex you know yeah so um there, think, there was a, a did you hear about the guy that uh, died recently from that he was a um like a weatherman or something. He was a, um, yeah. a new guy. Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. It's the same thing. So he went to, met a dude on Grinder, went to a hotel room, got meth, was in a gift mask, was on some kind of like sex table or something like that, and barfed into his gift mask and died. I can't remember his name. But yeah, have you heard of Ed Buck? Have you heard of Ed Buck in uh, Los Angeles? No, who's that? So Ed Buck was a well known Democrat. Well, he didn't really. He was a fundraiser. He didn't fund, raise that much funds for the Democratic Party, but he has been involved in these types of. Um, he's had two dead bodies of black men come out of his apartment in West Hollywood, and in all of the stories of people who've been with him say that it involves GHB, mainlining uh, drugs, you know, gay sex, the whole thing, and and so really dangerous kind of behavior with that guy. And there's been rumors that he's been doing it over the country too. So. Um, they need to research him. That's a rumor. That's not, that's, you know, I don't have any facts that he's, he's done that before. But you start looking into these cases. I've talked to people here in Los Angeles, like the Grinder um, Grinder app, like a lot of West Hollywood, there's a lot of, there's a subtext of violence and risk involved in that. You know, people get rolled, people get beat up. So um, a lot of these kids, more recent cases involved gay dating apps. And Stephen Port was on all these gay dating apps under different names. So he was soliciting people, uh, you know, very actively under different names. is very unusual. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of curious. So, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was kind of curious why the uh, Secret Service would be investigating this. Do they normally well, investigate? That's a, great, that's a great question. I mean, I don't know. I, I guess you could call them. I don't think they'd give you an answer. But uh, typically, the Secret Service has a preset, uh, you know, line of cases that they can cover. I think it's like, you know, messing with the currency, trafficking, um, and and tra so I think it might be a trafficking issue, you know, or international issue. So it's very interesting that they're there. They were both there. So um, yeah, I would highly recommend people for an update to watch. You can watch that Oxygen document, six documentaries or six part series on iTunes for like ten bucks. It's not bad, and it's worth it's worth every penny. I think they did a great job particularly on the Dakota James one, uh, was off the charts because, you know, they brought in a heavyweight who contradicted the medical examination, which also happened in another case called Chris, uh, Chris Jenkins in Minneapolis. And in that case, the actual police changed the determination from accidental drowning to either murder or, uh, you know, something unusual. So, and that happened in another case on this documentary where they changed the determination of death. 
So I think the police are catching up, which is uh, good. Really, it's really fantastic. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I thought was so interesting about your documentary is about the last half hour of it. Um, you, you get into kind of the symbolism of the smiley face itself, and you uh, talk about its potential origin in the in the Watchmen comic and and movie, and then you get into some of these bands including Nine Inch Nails and a video that they did with Peter Christofferson. And I think you also talk about Coil. Right. And it's all, it, I just nearly jumped out of my chair when I uh, heard you guys talk, when I heard you talking about that because I, I've been doing some work on that subject myself. And I was familiar with those bands from when I was a teenager and I used to listen to music like that. Right, and I, whistle, but... Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I always just thought it was so intriguing and, and odd and weird and interesting um, and I didn't really understand, you know, what the meaning was behind some of the f- stuff they were flashing. But right. then a couple of years ago, I ended up doing some research into, it, I guess it started off with some, some of the kind of Pizzagate stuff. And then I ended up in this trove of information having to do with some Marilyn Manson stuff. And that brought to my mind some of the Coil albums. So I started looking into that. And then I uh, saw for the first time in my life the actual video to Love Secret Domain, which right. me and my friends used to dance to at the goth club, you know, and we right. all, I, it was one of the creepiest songs I remember, right. uh, but I never knew what was so creepy about it. Now I see the video of the guys dancing there at a Thai brothel with little boys. Yeah, it's not girls though, they're 12 year old boys in, in G strings, right? Yeah. Yeah, and he's like gnashing his teeth at them, or the, the the front guy for the band is kind of threatening them with the lyrics to the song while he's watching them dance. Right. It's just his name is John Balance. So John Balance and him are in Coil, but Christopherson preceding Coil was he was with the Robin Gristle. Yes. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, um, I think you just you found a really important clue. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and tell us what you found about the Nine Inch Nails video. Well, the, the name of the video that was directed by Peter Christofferson was called Broken. Now, Peter Christofferson was part of the kind of avant-garde, cultural, nihilist, uh, post-industrial underground, and very smart guy. His dad was a professor in the UK. But he also, before he even got into videos, he did a lot of album covers. So he did three album covers for Peter Gabriel. He did a cover. He actually did Presents for Led Zeppelin that features this weird two-dimensional black kind of obelisk yeah, yeah. that was very creepy. So he had a real kind of dark occult sens- sensibility because he was a dark occultist. He collected Crowley stuff. And the music was kind of an outlet for a lot of his ideas. And you can see the traces of Crowleyanity in general occultism that flow through there. But I had seen one of his videos broken that really emulated a snuff flick. And when I was studying the Smiley Face Killers, I had remembered that video and I was like, I gotta watch that again. And I realized that that video was an encoding of the same MO of what is known as the Smiley Face Killers. They're driving around, they see a young man that fits the exact profile of the victims, the real world victims. He gets abducted, tortured, and he's drowned at the very end. He's actually drowned in a kind of BDSM kind of thing. And I featured that picture from Peter Christofferson on the cover of my documentary because I think there's a potential that these victims are pre-drowned. They're not drowned in the rivers they're found. And the, it's an, a false assumption that clouds the understanding of these cases to say that these are all drowning victims. There's absolutely very little proof that a lot of them are drowned, a lot of not public proof. So they're found in water, but that doesn't mean that they drown there. So um, that was really the key for me to look into Peter Christofferson and who was that person. And I had known, you know, I'd known about Crowley, Crowley, Crowleyanity, Crowley's influence. So researching him and having him talk about excrement and excrement is holy. And there's pictures of him with John Balance smearing their own feces on their face. Yeah, I was and, shocked at that. Yes. That, that. The whole segment at the end of the documentary, um, the... I think you're reading the lyrics or insert notes or something where they're essentially confessing to be killers. They're saying, I am a murderer, you know, and um, there's photography of them with totally being scatological in the most disgusting way. I mean, it's just terrible. 
I mean, right, is. right. I mean, and then you get into like the same kind of Crowley idea where the bodily fluids are wholly that that was kind of Crowley's sensibility. Um, so yeah, I mean, if that thing was that that statement being read by John Balance was the kind of ideology of the band, right? Yeah. So they yeah. were saying all kinds of admissions in that uh, that recitation, and there's all kinds of their visuals involved: the black hole sun, Crowley's unicursal hexagram. So even before the internet, really, they were very sophisticated in their kind of black magician, you know, roles and playing it out. And I've always thought about these cases that there's some, there's two things about the smiley face killers. It's the advent of real travel where people are traveling often and also communication over the internet, I think are both a part of these cases. And that's how I think the MO is learned. But like I was talking about Joey LeBute earlier, uh, that weekend was the weekend where the kind of a big convention took place, which was the Arnold Schwarzenegger Classic. So a bunch of bodybuilders come into town. Joey Labute disappears, you know. And then, I mean, what, what, if you were a perpetrator, you just skip town, right? right so, exactly. Um, yeah, so anyways, Peter Christofferson was, was networked. He did all these videos for Robert Plant. Um, I mean, just so uh, Pink Floyd, he did visuals for. Oh, his resume the, is insane. I couldn't believe his resume. It was insane. Yeah, like, oh, amazing like stuff, man. Biggest... A lot of well known. He did something for, what was the three boy band? He yeah, did one yeah. of their videos. Um, they probably have no Nelson, idea was what that what they were called? What was it? Was it? it was Nelson, wasn't it? Is that what Nel- they were called? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And he also did Rage Against the Machines, real early video. Yeah, real I saw crappy, that. Too. You know, nihilistic. And that was really their ideas, the ideals that he had with Genesis P. Orange and their band. They were very post-industrial, you know, uh, mentality, their sensibility, nihilism. And I think they called, they kicked, his real name was Neil Megson, who I think is dying right now, is Genesis P. Orange, Genesis Porridge. Uh, but they kicked him out of England because he had either real snuff films or fake snuff films recorded. And uh, people called him the wrecker of civilization. So, you know, they have a very remarkable pedigree. And I mean, I mean, it's <laughs> off the charts. People don't know about Peter Christofferson, but people in the alternative media should. They should understand him because he was very intelligent. And the way that he blew off steam was just like, he just was not unusual. Uh, he was a very unusual person. And I include him right there at the end of the documentary wearing a shirt that says I'm evil because I think that that really was his his sensibility was he was going to he was going to really investigate at an intellectual level all of the aspects of being an evil person yeah, transgression to the max exactly. I agree exactly. that's the yes, vibe exactly. yeah, maximum transgression this uh, completely mm-hmm. inverted concept of exactly um, that, not, that very few people would ever want to do or give themselves over to but I think him and John Balance went, the, uh, went that way, and John Balance went insane, seemed to go insane, and drank, was, woke up in the morning drinking wine. God only knows what kind of evil stuff they were involved in. But he supposedly fell off a, a ledge and died. That's the story they're telling. And then Peter Christopherson died at a fairly young age in Thailand, where one of these weird cases happened. Not at the same time, but he's both of them are dead. But um, they left a record, I think, that... Uh, People who are studying the occult, from not for an occultist purpose, but just to see what these guys think, really should look into. But do, do you think that people kind of find it hard to believe that artists who do uh, disturbing imagery in their art, in their music, would actually go go ahead and do it? And yes. to me, it was it was hard for me to get over. And I had to think, well, why is it hard for me to get over? And it's maybe it's because I'm. You know, I would think that if I was doing a crime, I would want to hide it and not let everyone know. And so you think, like, why would you write a song about it after you just did something like that? But really, it's it's a way of hiding in plain sight. Right. And then um, the other thing, too, is if there's an occult aspect to this, which, I mean, there, that's that's all it is. is a, you know, it's an act of occult. It's a, it's a magic act. Uh, then letting people know in, in a almost in your face way and just daring them to take you seriously, that might be part of it, you know, part of the sacrifice. Well, I would agree with that. And I think you make an excellent point is that they use different language. And I think the smiley face symbol and some of these other symbols are a way to communicate to fellow travelers what is going on without ever admitting anything, right? 
So people see the smiley face tag, they go, okay, I get it. You know, the other people who are into that stuff understand it. So I do believe, and if you look at like the broader context of criminal groups, whether they're gangs, crypts, bloods, Latin kings, they all have these symbols, you know, these symbols that they mark themselves, tattoo themselves with. If you see how these tat smiley face tattoos, they're all over the place. D. Antward, this one band guy, he's a well-known rapper. I mean, it just goes on and on. You'll just see all these people that have, in addition to other occult symbology, have this smiley face. So, Have you caught uh, what's going definitely. on with D. Antward recently, Bill? Have you seen that? I heard that there's even more crazy stuff these guys are involved in. You well, um, so. Di Antwerd, uh, the allegedly the singer, uh, the main the main male figure, uh, his name's Ninja, and he had like a a little 15 year old underage understudy and per, like got high on mushrooms, pretended to be demon possessed, and uh, sexually took advantage of her, and like she was keeping it on the down low, and now she's bringing it out in the press and. Yeah, hey, about her. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to jump in, but I just want to say she's 20 and they're going around suing everybody who's talking about this. So oh, just want to put okay. that in there. She okay. was 20. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, thank you very That's much. Yeah, yeah. Those are all speculative and alleged. We don't know them. Yeah, exactly. Right? I wasn't there, sir. Right. So okay. Well, neither was I. So and, oh, I was gonna that was the alleged it. story. You but I did. A... I actually did hear that came across. It came to my attention. Yeah. So yeah. he has the 23 Enigma tattooed on his shoulder, which is goes back to Burroughs and actually the smiley face goes back to Burroughs. Burroughs used the smiley face, which is why really? I think Nirvana used the smiley face is uh, Cobain's affinity for Burroughs. Do you know that Cobain and Burroughs did an album together? No, oh, I, yeah, did not I remember that. that one. Yeah. They did some like really underground work together. There's pictures of Cobain with Burroughs and Burroughs is wow. supposed to, I don't really know that much, I but that. I was told that he was like one of the, one of the early writers of it as a gay re revolutionary, this whole idea that the gay culture is an elite culture, that they can do, you know, kind of do what they want, kind of like Crowley. And mm. uh, so he, that was some of his writing, which, you know, ties in. And somebody's, somebody has sent me some incredible stuff. There are gay writers out there who have views that, you know, these young men are their, you know, ideal partners whether willing or unwilling so. yeah it's their yeah. harvest exactly yeah, i've seen yeah, it yeah yeah ginsburg so the whole different direction. sensibility that nobody would ever know yeah. but you start reading some of these gay nihilistic uh, literature i can't remember the guy's name offhand but it is off the charts it's unbelievable because well, uh, it fits right ginsburg, in with the ideology that would inform somebody to do these types of crimes this type of crime. are Alex you talking about hawking babe by any chance no, I know that guy. He's an occultist. No, the, oh, I'll see if I can find his name. But uh, Alan Ginsberg might be the name. I remember somebody giving me a, a book of poetry uh, of Alan Ginsberg's and reading through it. And, uh, you know, like some normal kind of far out beat poetry and then like really hardcore gay erotica and specifically yeah. focused on young men. You know, talking then, yeah, about there's a video of him, uh, you know, at a NAMBLA conference talk, writing poems about young men. So. Yeah, yeah. Ginsberg and that's, those guys all. And the whole, I saw in your, it's either in the documentary or otherwise, um, I was absolutely shocked to realize to what depth um, science fiction in general is uh, kind of painted into this boy love Nambla um, ping pong pizza corner. You know, like all of science fiction, like um, the, the same accusations are put against, uh, oh, who's the man? 2001 Space Odyssey, his name slips uh, out. Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke, like... Um, they were going to give him a big award and pulled it back because he was over there in Sri Lanka playing ping pong and openly right. soliciting boys and and not ashamed, not hiding it at all. You know, so he, there was a there was a, a a article that was suppressed that I included in my book, Children of the Beast. It was totally suppressed by the government in the UK, where he admits, "Oh yeah, I just pay him a little bit of money. They'll do whatever you want." Yeah. Like he's flat out saying that that is his class, and he he supported the ping pong club. That's where he would go to. You know, per date on these Sri Lankan kids. Yeah, it seems like so a it was theme. ping pong. Yeah, yeah, ping pong. Well, you know, there's an interesting scene in Kubrick's Lolita where there's a ping pong scene. So it seems to be a symbol, uh, a known symbol in that community. And Pizzagate was never properly investigated. And there are people. There are some of the videos that are taken inside of Comet Ping Pong have people wearing smiley face symbology. So it's there, you know, it's there. And people on that Instagram account, nobody ever mentioned it. Not his, but his friends, Elephantis' friends, 
have all kinds of uh, smiley face symbols. So pretty dark stuff, man. I, I've got the impression um, that the ping pong thing indicates a, uh, you know, a group situation where you've got the victim in the middle and then two perpetrators on either end, basically. That, so I'm that's not too uh, <laughs> graphic, but... Well, that's putting it nicely out. Oh, yeah. That's... <laughs> I'm just I'm laughing sorry. nervously here, but... I'm now, trying to find this guy, yeah. If I can okay. find his name, but I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Um... I just wanted to ask, like, has any, um, you know, I guess most of these cases, there aren't autopsies because they're assuming that they're drowned, right? So, Correct. But, I mean, yeah, have they, have they found any evidence of these guys being raped? Or I know there's some evidence of, t- of torture, like cigarette burns and things like that. Right. Well, that's it's a tough aspect of these cases is because there are, there's supposed to be a state-mandated medical exam on anybody. But the reality, the question is, is how authentic they are. If you look at this case of Joey uh, at uh, Dakota James, the, the, the thing isn't even correct. You had a foreigner guy, Shu Wang or whatever his name was, doing a lousy job. Um, and how common is that? Um, you know, how common is that for all of these cases? You don't know. So, I mean, in the in the McNeil case, the family waited ten years to get the autopsy when they got it. They found out their kid had been blowtorched in the, in the upper body, and his, uh, cops never told the family that. Wow. You know, so it looked like he had been in a chair being told blowtorched, just like the broken video. And the same thing happened with Chris Jenkins. So when P, when the families get these autopsies, and there, there's even cases just this year where the same thing has happened in Austin, where they get this this medical exam that's just totally different. So when, you know, I've had the unfortunate contact with some of these families when they start asking questions what happened i say always get the autopsy report that'll tell you something because the police won't tell anything so the cops are keeping something very close to their chest on this one um the the gay author's name is dennis cooper okay and, thank you uh, yeah look him up he has, he has a blog spot but this guy i mean there's a picture somebody sent me of dennis cooper and i'll see if i can post this but uh, too it's like the big the guy that he's with looks like your standard smiley face killer victim. Let me see. Yeah, is that, is it true, uh, William, that you have some kind of legal background? I I thought I remembered hearing that. Yeah, can you guys see that? Yeah. So that's Dennis Cooper with his boy. Look at his boyfriend. He looks like the standard skinny smiley face killer victim, doesn't he? The you're a smear. The guy on the right. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, so, even even thinner. Read his book. So he's influenced by Burroughs, Rimbaud, also a gay poet, Rimbaud. Uh, hey, I forgot who else. Is there, so, there any way we can see the right side of the screen I'm, there? I'm trying to adjust it. It jumped me to full screen as soon as uh, Bill shared. So that should be um, – trying. I'm almost there, there to go. fix it. So let's uh, – There it is. Let's try that. that... I'm sorry. Let me see. No, no, no. It's fine. We we've only okay. recently started using Zoom, and we love it. You know, it's worth the money, oh, but uh, all the functionality is not 100 percent yet. But is that is that showing it to everybody there? Is that nope. I changed it back there. That that should be. Uh... But like you so said, Zoom it's... is so much better than YouTube. It's not even comparable. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I, I do need some time to sit and practice with it a little bit more. But I'm already way happier to. Um... Did you get that picture? Do you want me to post it again? Uh, yeah, just leave, leave it there for a sec. Uh, we can see it. It's. I, I think the body language there is just fascinating. What the, what the guy on the right looks like, and then how the guy on the left is just smiling. Yeah, he's like has a hand over his mouth to wow, cover the it. fact that he's smiling about it. It, it. it could. Who knows? He could oh, just yeah, be I'm like, "Hey, look, you know." Right. If you read his stuff, this guy's stuff. I was told it's just like super. You know, corruption, um, you know, that kind of gay, avant-garde, heroin user, you know, that kind of mentality. So, yeah. Do you ever see people on Twitter um, t- threatening other people in a, in a covert way? Like, I now that I've, my eyes are open to this, I see it a lot, especially on certain accounts. Uh, uh, tell me people, more. I, what do you mean by that? Like um, dr- dropping uh, hints t- uh, to people that they're trying to intimidate. 
people oh, that they that might be a future victim or something. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that Jim Smith has seen things where these people are being um, told stuff or they're being there. There's a lot of there's a very strange text being sent at off times by some of these people or they've gotten texts like this is a beautiful full moon. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of a taunting aspect. Um, whether they're outright being threatened or like something's getting bad is going to happen. I've never seen anything like that. That's really that overt. But, you know, I was ashamed that none of these grinder accounts are ever subpoenaed and figure out who these people are. Because I think somebody, if they could solve one of these cases, they could solve 10 of them, just yeah, like Stephen yeah. Port. Because if you can get one guy who's committing this murder, you can figure out, trace him back and see how if he's done it before, right? So it's the same thing this guy, McAd have you heard of the McAd McAdams deaths in, in Toronto, where a guy was, he was a predator in the gay community. Once they trace one part, they actually, they actually arrested him while he had a victim, a young man, tied up on his bed. And wow! He literally had abducted somebody and tied him on his bed. But if you look up that case, it fits like this: my perpetrator typology to a T. His he had kind of older victims, but the people had all of those missing person signs up on, you know, street lights and sides like where is this person? And people didn't know where they went and. When they traced it back, they found out the dude had killed like ten people. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's just so mind blowing. Um, like the the confessions and um, depositions, the filmed that stuff is just bone chilling in that documentary of yours, Bill. That the, the yeah. watching those cops work those guys and getting them to confess to what they actually did. I actually uh, I just turned it off for a little while. Like man, that's so. I think you're right though that um, the the veil of silence. Uh, I think once somebody tumbles, there's probably an opportunity for a lot more progress to be made. Yeah, I think so. I, I hope the cops are, are looking in that, that sensibility. I mean, I don't have, I'm just an armchair researcher. I don't have resources like they do. The FBI's yearly resources are $9 billion. So they have means and ways to look under the surface that only I, can, that I can't see. So I hope that eventually they figure out what's going on and I think it's a shame, too, that they haven't really warned the public. You know, I've tried to get the message out, but I really think it's the government's responsibility to warn people. But there's a lot of other interests that are preventing that from happening. I don't think they want to panic the public. And I don't think they want to dissuade people from going to these colleges where a lot of these people are victims or most of them. So I think that, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very odd kind of situation where some information really isn't getting out. Well, it might connect with the general uh, roadblock that we've noticed with like research we've been doing uh, and and people that we're watching, where if it, if it ties into this trafficking thing at all, right. then all of a sudden you can't, you can't get any cooperation. Like everyone wants to act like it's fake. You know, you're, you're, get, you're going to get censored uh, with YouTube and Twitter. And then, if you go to the authorities, it, you get, I don't know, I've experienced, because uh, I've tried, a very weird um, interaction where they are kind of blowing you off and not encouraging you at all. To, they don't even want to hear the information you've got. And yet you get the vibe from the way that they respond that they know exactly what you're talking about. They've got their own files about it, yeah. but they just don't want to acknowledge it. All right. No, I've had that same experience. I gave up calling the cops. I used to, in like 2016, I was calling some of these police departments trying to inquire about some of these deaths and it was pulling teeth, man. Who are you? What do you want? I can't comment. Can't comment. After you get that over and over again, it's like, you know, no way. There's my cat. Yeah. We got, we got animals all around here too, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I've had that same experience and it's interesting. Like if you look at the Dakota James case, they basically said, show us proof that he was murdered. So they, push the investigation on the family. It's off the chart. So, And if you look at the Stephen Port case, the way that he was caught was it was a family member nagging and, and cajoling and pestering the cops for the CCTV video. And when they got that video, they said, who's that guy with my brother? Who's that guy? And that guy turned out to be Stephen Port. And then they started unwinding it. Who else have you been with, Steve? Where are these other people? And they figured out, they don't know how many people that guy may have killed. They got him for four 
he could have he could have wasted 20 30 people they'll never know so um it's crazy to think that these cases you're in a situation where the government is not working alongside these families but i would be very nervous if i was the government because the mothers of these victims aren't going away they're not going anywhere so i would just keep an eye out as these cases progress they are still progressing um yeah it's all it takes is one pull pull of one string and one one investigation and everything could easily unwind you know I, yeah so it would take don't you think this the, the, this kind of crime that it just takes a lot of nerve to do i mean well, wouldn't you be afraid of getting caught Especially if they're doing absolutely. it over and over again, you know? If you, if you look at some of these cases, so there was a girl, her name is Elise Soper, and she wrote about the drowning cases just in Boston alone. There's like a, like 30 cases in Boston, 30 in New York, and she had a, uh, a blog called Cryptid Antiquarian. So I re- if you're researching smiley face killers, I would recommend looking at her posts because her posts are really good, but also because there were like 2,000 comments on those posts where people are going this is not this is not legit these are not accidental drownings and then people started started to tell their stories where they were solicited where people came up to them and said hey can i buy you a drink where do you go to school you know they get skeezed out they start getting freaked out so i do think that these guys are clever enough let's see it's a two-pronged thing you have the clever perpetrators and the obtuse police who say nothing's happening these are accidental deaths which allow the predation to continue right so if you don't have somebody looking at it the predators probably thought this is a cakewalk right because nobody's ever going to think what happened so they figure out the steps that need to be taken and this happens when men drug women too right so that's the known thing is uh, date rape drugs where the guys probably like cosby how did he do it for so long right he had it down to a science hey do you want to come and same with they he and weinstein were very similar do you want to come talk about your career like he knew the kind of key things to say. Come on in, have a seat. I'm going to have myself a drink. Would you like a drink? Right. So they, he had the steps down to abuse, and the people who are committing this crime probably have the steps down, and they probably have had trial runs that they never got busted with. And there are two situations in Gilbertson and Gannon's book where guys ended up in the hospital. They don't know how they got there, but it's pretty clear that they were drugged, but they didn't end up as victims. So there's probably tons of cases, and people are talking about those cases now. There's a comedian. His name is uh, Tom Dillon, D-I-L-L-O-N. He runs a podcast, and he recently had a guy who claims to be somebody who survived the smiley face killings, a guy who said he was out, he got drugged, and he woke up next to a river. Wow. You know, you got to take it at with a grain of salt, but still, the guy seems legit. Why is he telling a story? So, you know, these, these, these facts are coming out in different places. Unfortunately, the, the shortcoming of a documentary is that you can't put in all that secondary and tertiary research because, you know, it's just too much information. But there's a ton of information on my YouTube channel. I've done so many interviews with Jim Smith and covered so many of the individual cases and interviewed a lot of people about the smiley face killings. So if you go to William Ramsey Investigates, you can just see it. It's all dated, so you can see how my investigation is progressing. My understanding is getting better and better over time. So I would suggest. So, Bill, do you have a point. legal background? Is that right? I, I've uh, right. I now. I am a member of the State Bar of California, so I did go to law school. I did practice law. I did. I'm still an inactive member. I still pay my dues. Yeah, I just wanted right. to be sure because I don't want to say that you know that you are a lawyer or be telling people that. I thought that that was true, and um, I just want you to know that your uh, your presentation definitely comes off that way, and I think it's a very good thing for any and all of your work. I've I've looked at a lot of your stuff. I uh, I remember listening to the Cortez readings that you did, and um, yeah. I think I found you through Jason Horsley on the Liminalist. Your um, Bill's interviews were about Crowley with the uh, Horsley on the Liminist, Liminist are just great. It's just really good well, conversational you. stuff. Um, what do you want to go over for for the audience? What you um, what you discovered about the meaning of the actual smiley face? I don't think we managed to get that far. So, so when I was researching the book about Crowley's influence, so tracing his influence through the gay movement, through uh, through modern culture, through music, Page Osborne. 
through the cultural people, Leary, Alan Moore is one of the people I came across. And he uses this smiley face that pops up really prevalently. It's a key component in the Watchmen series. And this, this comedian is one of the main characters who gets killed. Uh, is this guy who uses the smiley face. And actually, I think it goes back to Burroughs, but I really came across it through more. And that smiley face, he, he had all of these things. I think that more, as he said, there's, there's uh, documentaries about more. And in one of those documentaries, he says, I'm half a writer, and he's done a lot of, uh, he's probably the most famous graphic art, graphic novelists in the world, yeah. the most successful. He says he's half a graphic novelist and half a magician. So he's studying the occult. He knows the occult. He's had rituals. He's been in contact with entities by his own admission. And he and he's clearly integrating stuff into all of his stuff. And a lot of his material involves things that the occult from hell, whether it's uh, V for Vendetta, whether it's where he quote the, uh, the protagonist quotes cruelly, do what thou wilt, um, whether it's the Watchmen. So getting back to the Watchmen... Um, this comedian, there's a sequence in The Watchmen where he, the comedian is a person who goes to Vietnam and kills because it's a big joke. And it tied into some of these occult ideas, particularly cruelly, that reality in the universe is a big joke. Kind of like just like what you posted earlier today about the Joker, which was the laughing joke was also written by Alan Moore, right? right. This kind of grinning yeah. anti-hero, the Joker. So I think this conceptual conceptual ideas behind the comic are very similar to a lot of these deaths, is that they can commit them because it's a big joke. So that's probably the occult tie into at least some of these murders where that symbol is used. So and then I you know, it goes on because it's integrated in so many elements of common culture, movies. The new version of it has a smiley face at the intro. The ending of, of Stranger Things, the season eight, where they see the demo Gorgon. Um, there's a smiley face right there. So they kind of know that this symbol has a dark, a, you know, there's an esoteric and an exoteric meaning. And the esoteric meaning is a darker meaning. And you can go have fun unpacking Stranger Things, but I'm pretty sure they've listened to a number of my talks because huh. they put in all kinds of stuff. 77, they put in the West Memphis 3 information. Thing of oh, is one of the 77 names of Satan that uh, is in, uh, what's his name? Uh, one of these occult, uh, the Satanic Bible by LeVay. So, you know, they, they were pretty pretty sharp about some of their more occult references. The first season they referenced 77 11s. It's, it's a, and that girl's name is 11, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind of magic girl's name is 11. The number of magic. So... Anyway. So hey, I've got I've got uh, your book by the way. Hey, and, uh, this is this is where I first heard about you. This book and uh, it was really um, well. Well, <laughs> it was really an eye opener because there we go. Sorry, All it right. was originally just a manuscript. That's why I kept it eight by ten. Now the new version is six by nine. It'll fit on your bookshelf, but uh, thank you. So so yeah, all these numbers that you're mentioning: eleven, seventy-seven, ninety-three. Uh, and 175, these are all numbers associated with 9-11, and then you show how Alistair Crowley had lots to say about the meaning of each one of these numbers. And then you even tie it into the Bush family. And I get the, the idea from what you've written and other things you've said that you're one of the people that believes that there is a biological connection there between Alistair Crowley and, and the Bush family. Is that right? Well, that's a good question. I think... Looking at all the facts, what makes the most sense, even though I have no evidence, is that the arranged marriage of George W. Bush or George H. W. Bush, the senior, and Barbara Bush was an arranged marriage, knowing that she was the offspring of Alistair Crowley from her mother, Pauline Robinson, who was in France at that time, same time Crowley was, and was alleged to be a servitor while Crowley was doing one of his rituals called ECL, Arato Comatose Lucidity, and it required servitors. So I think that the times and dates, sensibilities, ideas, all fit together, that they're actually kind of this uh, elite, you know, uh, something out of a science fiction movie where they were put together for breeding purposes because they believe that the best genes and 
this kind of mentality is really ideal. So I think that it's, it all fits together. 9-11, the dates, the occultism of the Bush family, um, the skull and bones. The fact that the, the numbers are used in sequence in such a very intelligent manner. 1177, the Libra Oz, the numbers of, of uh, the devil. The, the fact that 93 is really a cruelly number, you know. It references in the Kabbalah to two su- su- uh, supreme concepts within his religion, the Lima and Agape, will and love, right? Love under law, love under will. But then the 175 is even more sharp because it goes back into this notion of people who love Satan, that they adore him. The adoration of Satan, you'll see that in common culture. It's a common phrase. And so, uh, and that's supposed to be like a ritual. It's a ritual. So then you can kind of look at it in the broader context that 9-11 was a very sophisticated mega ritual involving occultism to have, to, to make change in conformance with the magician's will. And that change was really a global change, new world order change that that family was uh, interested in promulgating. Well, this is this is the same mentality that you're describing with the smiley face killers, really, right? To, so. to kill so many people for some ritual purpose and then, you know, laugh about it afterwards. You know, they're laughing, and uh, it's like, so okay, so that would explain then why the Secret Service is investigating the subject, or rather, perhaps investigating people who are investigating it. And that's an excellent point. I'm glad you made that statement. <laughs> well, it's uh, okay. So, yeah, on the one hand, you've got this, you know, criminal case that you're stu- or ongoing set of criminal cases that you're studying that someone could look into without knowing anything about conspiracy theories and just take it totally seriously and, uh, and never really have to get off into the, the weirder subjects in order to understand what's going on there. But but then it's got to connect to this other stuff because, okay, so people think about Crowley. If people have ever really spent a lot of time studying him, and especially if you've ever, you know, dipped your toe into any of these groups that he started and that continue to basically worship him. Give me, give me uh, one sec. Hold on. Sure. Yeah. You, you can keep going, Tracy, or uh, I could just cover uh, for a second. It's all right. I'll, I mean, I'll do that. Okay, yeah. It's Go like you, you don't think of these people – as being the Illuminati, right? You don't think of them as being the big conspiracy, the controlling the world, because you just think of them. Well, you you can, you can see them influencing these these kind of um, weird bands that we're talking about, like Coil and stuff. And you know that you yeah, know definitely Cro- Crowley has had some influence in pop culture, and so the, the armchair researcher will find that out pretty quickly, but. You still might find it hard to believe that, like, the the people that are actually controlling the world might be into Aleister Crowley's magic too. Oh, sorry but, about that. Can you can you restate that? Sure. I'm just uh, I, I said it in a long winded way for the audience, but really, all I was just saying, like, when you meet OTO people, for instance, your first impression is not that these are the people controlling the world, right. and you might think that uh, you can see them easily influencing weird bands and weird artists. But you don't think of Aleister Crowley being the grandfather of the future, or great-grandfather, I guess, of the future president. But then you just explained how it could have happened, and there's actually a bloodline to trace there. There's actually a story to follow that makes it all make sense. It's not just that they look similar with their facial features. There's a reason to believe that they could be related. And then if you were to take that seriously, then you look at the weird things that have happened in the Bush presidencies and look at the nu- the numerology and the symbolism, consider the Aleister Crowley influence, and it all falls into place. It's mind-boggling, but I yes. think you're right. Right, and that date, 2001, was such an important date. You know, It was really a, a nexus point, a confluence of so many different things that... Um, and those, those years of Bush were really incredible. There was all kinds of wars and... Uh, social dis- uh, upheaval and the, dis- the, the literal pumping and dumping of the entire economy in 2008. I believe they did it intentionally. I don't think that that was some random invent. I no, think no, absolutely. Zero under Bush, and then 
de-rigged and then knew that the docks were all crap and that the whole thing was going to go down in a big old furnace, a massive, a massive dumpster fire. Because people then would be interested in trying to save their house and their, their butts instead of tracing any illegalities or criminality that was involved. So um, it all fits together. There's not proofs. I don't have proofs. But if you put that picture of Barbara Bush right up next to Crowley, it's a freaking carbon copy. I'm sorry to say that. They both have big blocky heads. Crowley was of Irish descent. Um, so, you know, these things uh, fit together. And you can see that pattern of how that the, you know, the Bush family's influence on so many events, so many not very savory events, uh, drug dealing and all kinds of stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't I honestly, I don't have a lot of proofs, but all the, all the, the notions, Crowley himself, if you really research Crowley, he didn't really care if he had like out of wedlock kids. Somebody came to him later in life and said, I want you to have my son. He said, sure, whatever, I'll, I'll do that. And he had children that, I think one of them, he said, oh, she'll make a nice whore, like real. Of course. Uh, he was never a parent. He never was around it. Well, it gets worse than that. I mean, there's some discoveries they made on uh, one of his more recent books where he was raping his two-year-old kid and his wife was doing it too. It's like he wrote that in Magical Record of the Beast, 666. So it's not a pretty tie, and it fits right in with a lot of this infant abuse ideas and stuff like that. So it's really grim. Crowley is a very evil person. I'd call it prophet of evil for a reason. Um, but, you know, if it's will over right and wrong, if it's your will, whether it's trying for the real will like Hitler, you know, things go wrong. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if the people who are perpetrating the smiley face killer's crimes are, you know, trying for the will types. Do it that will types. I think I, think I told you that I saw on Instagram – an art display that was being pictures of it were being posted by people who were um, in the now modern manifestation of the process church. And a lot of them are holdovers from the original one. So they were having this art show and there's a painting in there of Barbara and, uh, and Alistair Crowley hanging out together. So it's almost like these people that I think would have some direct insight into whether or not that, theory was true are making a joke about it right well that's it so then you see the insider joke which is probably the use of the smiley face Uh, do you ever see the meeting of ozzy osbourne with george bush where he was at the white house yeah if you can find that video it's very important because uh george bush is talking to osbourne and osbourne gets up and makes the masonic healing sign to to george bush he puts his hands over his head and starts waving his hands so he makes this Masonic sign to George Bush, and then Junior starts talking to him. He goes, Sabbath, buddy, Sabbath. Children, uh, war pigs. Hey, Ozzy, mom loves your stuff. And he just basically referenced it. It's like a little inside joke. So you Whoa. can find that online where he says mom loves. The full, the full video isn't there. So there's all kinds of little things. George Bush Sr. is wearing the 77 hat. He's got the 77 number on the George Bush aircraft carrier. They're wearing purple, the, the, the imperial colors, you know. And interesting, in some of those pictures that I included in Prophet of Evil, you would think that George Bush Sr. would be the very center of the picture, of the frame. But it's not. It's her. So, you know, <laughs> she's not the president. Why is she the center in some of these pictures? So, so I think there's a lot of inside stuff there. And if you listen to her, like her comments after, I think it was Katrina, where she had very uh, Crowley uh, similar statements about, Peasants, you know. Oh, yeah, this is good yeah, for them. All those African Americans are fighting for their life in the in the stadium, you know. And she's like, "Oh, this is good for them." They're in she said it was place. a great opportunity for them. I remember, right? She yeah. Said, so she know, said, and like there's a, I actually quoted in the um, Prophet of Evil where she was talking to Larry King, and she said, "Well, as far as my kids go, Barr and George and all these people, whoever messes with them, I'll I'll kill you." I don't said that on TV, so. Wow. Yeah, it's incredible. And you can, you, if somebody can find that video, it's probably just totally memory old now. But, uh, uh Tracy, didn't we play else. a video so, where yeah. she so the, comes the notion on that, yeah, during Halloween that, as a witch? Have you seen that? Yeah, have you ever yeah. seen her where she's talking to people and she's like using the mesmerism techniques where she doesn't blink? 
Did, no, did you ever hear the story where she had the fetus of one of her kids in the jar? And yes. Oh, yes. It's crazy. It just gets weirder and weirder. It doesn't get better. No, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> we should do a whole show just on Barbara Bush. Isn't it? Hey, man, did you get into Skull and Bones? They have a private library. You know, they're involved in they're involved in the Grove at the Bohemian Grove. They're hanging out on all these illegal cult stuff. Imagine what George Bush Jr. grew up in. You know, his dad's a master spy, high level occultist. You know, you don't, I mean, the, the guy was trained. I mean, do you ever hear, yeah, I mean, you can just go into it. Do you ever hear the album Rio Grande Blood by Ministry? No, I'm familiar That's with Ministry, but I've never Jr. listened to it. I mean, you got to read, you got to watch that. It's incredible. Oh, my God. Listen to the song Rio Grande Blood. Is, and, is that think, on, it takes one to know one because they wrote some stuff about Crowley, too. Uh, Psalm 69, which was taken from Crowley's Book of Lies. Yeah, I know that. I know that song. Yeah, that's. I was going to point that out earlier when you were pointing out uh, the fact that it is. It seems like the the more layers you peel back of the onion skin, the more synchronicities and connections you find. And it's no coincidence yeah. that Al Jurgensen and Ministry and um, the, uh, there's another industrial band from that time. They were in your documentaries to slip in my mind, but it's Ministry and another one, and Coyle's kind of in the same group. The fact yes. that they're, they're making songs that are, on their surface, they appear to be the polar opposite of the current government, but then you get into where we all are in searching and looking, and it's like, oh no, they're just, it's like a commercial. You know, Ministry's like a commercial for the Bush administration's wars and their occultism. Dude, you got to listen to the album Rio Grande Blood. Do you know that it was nominated for a Grammy? No, I'm going to have to yeah, check Yeah, it was this nominated out. Wow. for a Grammy. I can't remember what year it is. I'll have to look it up. Listen, guys, I got to take like a 10 minute break. I'll come back, but I just got to go run an air real quick. Yeah, no okay. problem. We'll, we'll, just, right, we'll, we'll just keep okay. you rolling. We'll, we'll keep rolling. Thank you. This guy fits in perfect. He knows exactly what to do. <laughs> <laughs> This is the part where Jim, if it was just me and Jim back in the day, you guys, this is the part where Jim would grab his phone or his tablet, open it, and start reading jokes because I would hold it as long as I could and then I'd run off to the bathroom like, I gotta go, Jim. And then, there you go, you're on. And then, yeah, <laughs> then Jim would read some jokes on his phone. So, But um, how, go, you were going to say something, Tracy? Go ahead. Oh, no, I just, I don't, I don't know when that album came out, but I do remember the uh, song um, NWO, yeah. which probably came out in like 94. And, you know, he's, he's got the scratchy voice going on, he's screaming. You can't really understand everything he's saying. But I remember him saying, he's like describing, you know, wars, I think, and kind of a uh, um, dystopian future of the New World Order. And then there's this line where he's saying, I watched the destruction through the eyes of a clown. That, I, that part I could hear. And so I remember when I heard that song, and I knew those guys were into magic and, and Aleister Crowley, and I already knew about, you know, I was a teenager, but I had already heard about, like, Masonic conspiracy theories and the New World Order and stuff. And I just thought that this song was occultists laughing about what the big occult conspiracy is. And so even though, yeah, the way that they look, the, the way they dress the crowd that they appealed to, you would think that that's kind of the counterculture and therefore maybe the anti-government crowd or at least the anti, uh, you know, establishment crowd. But they were, it was, I don't know what they would say now in an interview, but I, I took that song at the time when I first heard it as laughing praise and enjoyment of the horrible reality that the new world order was creating you know and so not that i thought necessarily they were part of it but it was almost like they were being spokesmen for it you know right and that's it seems like uh man it, i thought it was just earlier today it slipped my mind but something similar where we uh
So okay, there we go. We're back. Sorry, Sorry guys. folks. Uh, Jim was trying to solve a camera problem, and um, if you don't add the microphone, sometimes you'll find us uh, dead in the water, a little bit of dead air. We apologize. Um, if you didn't catch it last week, we uh, we added a second mouse and keyboard so that we could overcomplicate the control of the behind-the-scenes switchboard, and it is such a good time to now share instead of doing it all by myself. Um, but yeah, that's what happened. And I did this once before. If you've been with us a few episodes, you definitely recognize this oops on the microphone kick. Sure. But we're back now. And uh, thank you so much for always letting us know. I remember yeah. one time, remember my girlfriend called me on the show. She's like, the mic's not on. But it looks <laughs> like we've got it fixed. Hey, can I, can I share the, uh, the Raisin Bran box with everybody? Yes, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Tracy Twyman on generic Raisin Bran. Okay, so yes, this is a Kroger generic raisin brand. Yeah, you get, hold on, let's get your full screen there. Can you get her on the full screen? Yeah. There we go. Oh, there we go. All right. Okay, so that's what the front of the box looks like. Rather ordinary. And here's the back, which I will read to you in a minute. And let's see if I can get in. I have to... There's definitely the actual pyramid there. there. Go. Okay, so oh, Bill's gonna be disappointed he missed this. <laughs> <laughs> you see the Illuminati pyramid there? Yeah, I'll just go ahead and read this to you. What did you say the pyramid says? I forgot. It says Mwahaha. <laughs> okay. So here's what it says. You know what they say. Flake it till you make it. So they may actually say Fake it till you make it. But what do they know? And who are they anyway? The masses and majorities? The Illuminati? Thurston, quote, danger pants, McGillicuddy the <laughs> third? And why? <laughs> just, what? And why promote fake when there's a whole wide world of flake? Crispy, cravey, light and wavy flakes. Scrumptious, crunches, righteous, delightous flakes. <laughs> Yummers in your tummers, flaky when you wakey. Flakes. I mean, is that a is that a weed reference? Flaky when you wakey to, for kids when they're eating their breakfast. Uh, so come on, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your appetite. When hunger calls, you've got to flake it till you make it. <laughs> that is so. Weird. That's what I was talking about. That that reminded me because we were talking about uh, the Denver airport weirdness. How they brought the. It, like if you haven't seen it, folks, they're like they've got like a talking gargoyle joking about the Illuminati at the Denver airport, which is also a location so replete with weird satanic occultism that, like, if you don't know about it and you're watching our show, we don't know how you haven't heard till now. But I would say the fact that they're bringing it out even stronger at Denver, and then the weirdness of the cereal box—it's like we're we're going through this huge group. Uh, initiation into the externalization of the hierarchy. They're showing, they're, they're revealing their method. They're like, hey, we're going to come full circle and bring you into the big joke, the big smiley face joke is, ha ha, the whole world's run by Satanist Illuminists. And uh, even on your G General Mills cereal box. I can't believe it. I really can't. So I, I wonder if all of these references are on purpose or if they're just a subconscious sort of reference to uh the the thing i mean there's there's a lot of smiley face references in movies that he that uh bill was talking about and is that do, do the people that put that stuff in the in the tv in the media do they do they are they aware of what it means do you think or is it sort of a subconscious uh dark thing that they're picking up on i i think you know we can we can have bill clarify for himself but i think he might not be necessarily saying that every smiley face has this dark occult meaning or it might it may actually have an origin like that but it's it's a context thing so you know it's when you see this particular graffiti next to a place where some guy disappeared and later was found in the exact same manner of, you know, turning up weeks later in a, in a river. 
And you just, it just, it's accumulation of evidence over time after you see it over and over again that this is a clue to the fact that these things are connected. And it's also a clue to what is the motivation and to who's doing it and what's, what's the motivation. It's not a very specific one. It's very vague. And of course, it's vague enough to be deniable. Like, you know, you see all sorts of things, you know, you see uh, for a good time call and you see gang graffiti and you see swastikas yeah, and yeah. things like that. So all of those things could be very sinister in the in a different context. Well, do you remember and that obscure... This, this is sinister because of the context. Do you remember that, that obscure movie? Uh, um, what was it called? With Tom Hanks, where he was... Uh, he did all that stuff. Um, he... Uh, shoot, I forgot. The, the name of the movie just, just slipped, slipped my mind. Oh, uh, you read the running... Uh, Tom Hanks, Tom so it Hanks. must be uh, the... The one with the box of chocolates. Yeah, the box of chocolates. Forrest Gump, yeah. Forrest Gump. Ah, thank you. It, Forrest Gump, there was a... Yeah, there was a happy face, smiley face uh, t-shirt that he invented. And also... It, oh, really? Was there a smiley face in Forrest Gump? Yeah, he... Uh, he uh, he was he was running across the country and somebody gave him a, a t-shirt, a failed t-shirt. Oh, that's right. gave him a shirt and he wiped his face on it. And, and what ended up happening was... It made a happy face, a smiley face, on the shirt, and the guy sold him and became a millionaire. Hey, and then the supposedly the, the dang volleyball is a smiley face too. Oh yeah. So yeah, we're finding some extra smiley faces here. Well, right? I was also thinking about the uh, ping pong in Forrest Gump. There was also he was a ping pong champion. That's right? true. That's so true. it's another reference to this weird stuff. And I, to clarify, for what I'm not, I'm not saying for sure, but I think what Jim's getting at is that. Uh, Obviously, sometimes intentional symbology is placed in things, and a lot of people might miss right, that or overlook it. Oh, yeah, so we're here, Bill, to catch you up. Uh, we're still kind of coming back to the smiley face point. Um, okay. Jim, uh, I don't know if you I don't know if you can see Jim. Jim's sitting here, too. I, you know, I he, saw him. So um, I was trying to screen share, but it was messing us up. But he was pointing out that uh, in Forrest Gump, um, Tom Hanks uh, wipes his face, and it makes a smiley face on the T-shirt. Um, right. We were speculating as to whether or not whether or not the symbolism is always intentional and encoded, or if sometimes it's not just like a subconscious bubbling over, or a, you know, it becomes not necessarily one hundred percent coincidence, but also not an intentional occult symbol. You know. Yeah. Well, it wasn't really dark in Forrest Gump, but like in the movie It, it was kind of a, an ominous thing. So. Right. Or, or Stranger Things. So I think you have to look at it in context, you know. If you saw an 11 at a football game, the likelihood that somebody's trying to get you with a magical number is very low. But in some of these Hollywood movies, like, if you watch Oliver Stone's movies, he knows the numerology, man. If you watch the intro to uh, Natural Born Killers, he has, like, a thing of uh, 77 Sunset Strip. Oh, yeah. All kinds of 666. So... It's uh, something else, especially also his movie World Trade Center. Have you ever watched World Trade Center? Never have. There's like uh, 93s and all kinds of stuff. The firemen are wearing 11s. He's got all the new, he knows the numerology. It's incredible. Yeah, I've, I I know a little bit about him. Uh, you know, like I've, heard, I've talked to some family members of his. That, you know, he, he definitely knows, uh, you know. Yeah, like, you know, he's probably part of one of those secret groups, the Yale, the Yale groups, you know. So um, you have some stuff about Process Church on your on your Vimeo account. I noticed that. Do you have a, a documentary about that, or? Well, I had I did some research. I researched a guy by the name of Timothy Wiley, who was really the number three guy at the Process Church, and I included a segment about the Process Church in my book, Children of the Beast, because it really was an offshoot of Scientology, a much more a darker kind of. Uh, more in a, it was just like a not for the masses like Scientology was, um, but it was a definitely a cult that was influenced by that stuff. That I think the, the woman died, um, but the man, uh, his name was Moore. I think he actually lived in New York. I don't know if he's dead yet. Timothy Wiley recently died in the last couple of years, but uh, he was an interesting case study. So I included some video about him, and you can see him kind of log rolling with other known kind of occultists or people in that. 
in that milieu if you it's want. It's a great you know, metaphor, Bill. I, so, I want that metaphor to, to stick around. That's a great metaphor. Occ Occultist log rolling together. We need some <laughs> yeah. memes, folks. If you're up for making some memes, definitely put like Crowley and Johnny Depp on a log or whatever, like, you know. Mm -hmm. Curly well, they help each other out. You can tell they're just like serving up softballs for you know yeah. not, not difficult questions. So, um, well, while you were yeah, gone, so, Tracy sorry. read the back of a cereal box that she has there, and it's just like a generic raisin bran box, but um, the it's got like Illuminati symbolism on it. It's got the pyramid and and like. All this strange, almost enchanted kind of goofy poetic language, and it's just—it's so in our face in comparison to how it used to be. Even I would say, even five years ago. I mean, all of us that have been doing this for a while can recognize ten, fifteen, you know, even more. The stuff wasn't out there. You had to dig hard. The internet wasn't as accessible, so you had to really look around and start referencing, reading citations, and and uh, asking around, you know. But now, yeah, like literally point. on the back of a generic cereal box, Tracy, while you while you stepped away, she read it out for us, and uh, it's it's a trip. It's an actual it joke about the Illuminati, yeah, on, on the cereal. Go for it. Well, I don't so know do what you to say. do you believe um, what what the guy from the Ultimate Evil? I'm forgetting his name right now, but uh, like he had Maury, whole, Maury Terry. Maury, Maury Terry. Okay, so he was thinking like Process Church got into this um, this hitman business and they right. were they were going around killing Metzger, people. Metzger yeah. and Manson too. Um, I think that they were I think uh, I think that uh, the guy who was busted for the son of Sam murders was part of a cult. Yeah. So I think that they were hanging out at Untermeyer Park in New York and that there were tendrils that went from there probably all over the country, but reached all the way to Stanford. Uh, Stanford University Chapel, Chapel where Arliss Perry was murdered. I wrote an article about that murder because I grew up in Palo Alto, so I used to actually know the priest who uh, he was like family friend who was the priest at the time that she was ritually killed. And the rumor was is they moved her body, and only the the, the people um, on the inside knew, but she was found on the altar. Well, I thought it was really strange the guy they eventually. Uh, tried to arrest and he killed himself before they managed to get inside his apartment to arrest him. But right. like, he's the guy that if you if you read the Ultimate Evil, there's, he's actually mentioned there because he was the security guard. Security guard, right? And they and they mentioned he, Maury Terry talks about him as though well he's already been eliminated. Eliminated, right? Okay, so well, he had a copy just, of Maury Terry's book when they found him in his apartment, right? And that murder was done on Crowley Moss, right? October twelfth. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it seems like very inside, you know. It seems like it's, it's more than coincidence that he got away with it as long as he did and then he got the tip off, you know, to to swallow the cyanide capsule and whatever he did. He probably blew his brains out. But, um, yeah, like, that, a lot more that to that story. End. Yeah. I'm sorry, I talked over you. What did you say? Oh, I was just saying, I guess that's the way it was planned, was like, you know, when you finally do get caught, uh, you're going to kill yourself. And then they did, you know, it was like a, a a story only in the local paper that he got arrested. Nobody else mentioned it or that they tried to arrest him. And then uh, they never elaborated, you know, like the police department never said anything more about it, which the, the most... The nicest thing you could say about that is maybe they are, they're still investigating something broader, and that's why they don't want to come out with the information. But otherwise, shouldn't they give some the public closure on what was a big deal at the time, you know? Right. No, well, that's a good point. I don't know. Don't you think more people were probably involved instead of just one guy? Yes. How, did she, how did she get into the chapel, you know? Yeah, how, how did, did he get eliminated as a suspect in the first place? Right. Yeah, it's super fishy. So, yeah, I mean, I think if... if you know, there's all this circumstantial evidence that Process Church was, on the one hand, it's uh, trying to infiltrate all of these uh, bands, pop culture things in the 60s, and successfully doing that. And then, you know, on the other hand, they're, oh, they're also infiltrating the, Ma the Manson family. They're implicated by other criminals that have already been convicted or confessed to, uh, you know, be, being involved in 
you know, child trafficking and and uh, murdering people being murder for hire, yeah. murder for hire, and then even disguising either disguising it or if it's not a disguise, it's like they add on this element of a ritual, and maybe it means something to them because they are a real cult. But at the same time, it gives the crime cover so that nobody looks into the broader reasons why a, per- a certain person was uh, targeted. So it just seems to me like this was the beginning of what ended up uh, what now encompasses smiley face killers like that. Whatever that cult is that's doing smiley face killers, I wouldn't doubt at all if they're, you know, if you could trace their lineage, if you ever find them, you know, you can trace them to the process church. I mean, do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all. I think one of the uh, Manson family's victims, one of the lawyers, their defense lawyer, was found in a river. Can't remember the name of him right now. So, oh, yes. you know, uh, you know, you wouldn't be surprised. If, I think Manson probably was murdered, uh, hired out to kill Polanski's uh, Sharon Tate and those people. It's probably what happened. It was never explained, but that family. So I wouldn't be surprised if underground there are all these knowledge and connections of how to pull off the perfect crime, you know, and, and then ritualize it, too, if you if they do or want to or certain dates. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's a direct lineage that goes back 50 years, 40 years. I wouldn't be we're surprised we're at getting all. a question from the chat here uh, for you, Bill. Um, if you're familiar with William Sims Bainbridge, uh, Oswald yes. Spanger in the chat says he's also related to this process church angle. Um, have you heard no, of I don't think I've Bainbridge ever heard that was name. a very uh, astute uh, academic, actually, an, in, an intellectual guy who wrote a number of books on a variety of subjects, but one of his books was about the process church. And I tried to get in touch with Bainbridge. I actually have his reference stuff. You know, you can send emails to these guys, you know, uh, accounts at these universities. They never get back, <laughs> never get back to you. They yeah. must not answer their you or they don't know who I am or what. They don't even care. But Bainbridge is one of them I've never been in contact with. But when I was researching the process church, I tried to get, and that book is hard to come by. I think it's very expensive right now. I can't remember the title, but yeah. I know of Bainbridge. Yeah, that's it. Um, were, were you going to say something there, Tracy? No, not at all. Go okay. ahead. Um, I was going to say that uh, if you've never heard of Steve Outram, we had him on the show a few weeks ago, and uh, Steve's excellent. He's really well known for the uh, for the Burning Man stuff. He's done a huge expose on Burning Man about how it's pretty much a huge uh, sci-tech uh, government op, kind of uh, Woodstock 2.0. But we were pointing out at the time that um, – they had just busted all this uh, new Michael Jackson documentary stuff out. What was Michael Jackson, um, uh, R. Kelly. They brought all that out at the identical time that Nexium really would have been hitting the press. And we speculated at that time that they were once again paralleling, damage controlling. Now here it's a couple weeks later and they're um, recanting and or casting doubt on some of their uh, statements published in that Michael Jackson Leaving Neverland documentary. So... Um, right. And, and the, you know, the Nexium stuff does continue to develop, and it's really ghastly, kind of all in the same vein. Yeah, so, it's getting worse. There's more and more stuff that comes out, it's getting worse. It, seem, it seems like they're definitely pulling their typical media trick of getting us a sleight of hand. Um, but it seems to me like they're using similar subjects, like instead of just using something bold and blatant like a, a war bombing or something, or a scandal... Now it's like they're using taboo sex issues to distract us from more severe, uh, more severe crimes and acts of the same nature. You know, go back and That's think a- about Michael Jackson, but don't think about that. You know, the Smallville actress is branding people and selling child sex slaves. You know, as it's happening, they're making it parallel once again. You know, it's a- well, that's an excellent and superb point because you got to look behind who financed. The Neverland documentary, right? And why they wanted to put it out. You trail that. You follow that road. You're like, why is Oprah uh, putting this out? Why are all these moguls behind this Neverland? What's the issue? Are they deflecting? Very important. And the Nexium, it's really dark. There's a couple murders associated with that. They just had somebody come out locked in a room for two years. They locked some girl in a room. Uh, there's human trafficking. The original, um, the complaint has been amended, it's been updated, but the original complaint alleged human trap. I think human trafficking of a girl under the age of 14. And that was almost never mentioned 
and it's pr I give kudos to uh, the court there in New York for it's never leaked who their victims are, you know, which is really a uh, credit to the legal system for that. Nobody's ever put that out. So um, this is actually the same issue that's happening right now in the Epstein case, which involved international trafficking of young kids to elites. It's an, that's an incredible story. The totality of which has not really been realized. So I do think that there are deflections and that there are probably very powerful people who would wish to have people looking at one thing as a misdirection for their own mis their own misdeeds. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's going to get in more and more interesting as, as things progress. The Epstein case isn't going away. So uh, I hope not. The Epstein case actually ties into Avenatti, which ties into Nexium. These things are all connected because the same lawyers who are representing the victims of Epstein are the same lawyers that Avenatti walked back into and threatened and, and threatened them, and now is getting a criminal complaint because he didn't send he didn't send a proper demand letter. He started just using verbal threats. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, get this. This is how this is how dumb Avenatti was. So what he does is goes to Boyce Flexter, like this probably one of the best law firms out there, maybe you know top law firm that represents these girls who were abused by, by Epstein. For multi-million dollar judgments, big numbers, right? Some of these. So they go in there and then he sells them that he has, I mean, this is alleged, he tells them that he has information. He has information about Nike doing wrongdoing and then leaves. And then they call him back and say, can you come back and tell us that and extort us again? Because we didn't hear it the first time. And he walked <laughs> back in and extorted him again and didn't think that there was going to be any problem. Like he walked right back into a trap. Yeah. Like they, then the then the uh, then the um, law enforcement FBI <laughs> were there to record it. Like it's just so dumb. Yeah, oh we didn't God. get you on tape but, the first uh, time. No, yeah, that guy. I always thought I think he they was have a mark. I totally seemed like a total mark from the very beginning. You know, the first time I saw him, I'm like, oh, this isn't going to end well. You know. Yeah. Oh no, it's really bad. There's a, a side case that's not even associated with the Nike case where he he faked his tax response. Uh, his tax returns for 2012 and 2011 and overstated them so he could get a $4.1 million loan. So he's done. He can just send his bar card back to this. Well, in my opinion, he's done. He can just, he's in deep, deep, deep trouble. He's really, <laughs> and that's probably why he, he thought that the threatening of Nike was his, his way out is that he was doing desperate things to yeah, his, cover up earlier misdeeds, is my guess. Black hat, golden parachute, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, that's, I mean, he really, that's, he was like Icarus, man. He ascended way up real fast. Yeah, he's on TV shows, wings. but uh, <laughs> he's going to, he's going to spend, he's in deep, 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 deep trouble. Wow. Yeah, I know. It just yeah. boggles. It makes it like I, I was trying to think of what to say next, but I'm so dumbfounded. It. Um, well, here I've got something to say. Well, if you want to get, really have an insight into the Epstein case, I would suggest that you look at a filing that was done by um, Castle C A S S E L L. It was a response to a motion to uncover. There's a huge battle going on involving Dershowitz, Cernovich, and these guys to uncover the victims. They want to know their names, but. The response by this castle guy was fantastic, and he exposed these guys who really want to uh, know the names of the victims. And they've been see I mean, there. It seems. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to say this carefully, but it see there seems to be an issue, in my opinion, that people want to get the girls' names who were victims so they can intimidate them. Yeah, and that's why they're kept as Jane Doe and John Doe. And so this castle response, let me see if I can find it. I actually have it. Um, let me see if I can. Yeah, no, if you didn't see it, folks uh, it's out really there fascinating. in the audience. Sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. I just, uh, while you were looking, I was going to say, if you didn't see it out there in the audience, I definitely saw some photography posted of Epstein's little blue and white uh, cube-shaped temple sands the gold uh, lions and the big gold dome. And um, I assume that that probably was real gold and we're seeing some confiscation of of wealth, or at least, I don't know, uh, all, all of us out here in this conspiracy realm watching the worst things happen to women and children by the most 
um, unbelievably wealthy and powerful people that we know their names. Uh, I think we all have that hope that something's happening, you know, and I know on the right. the, the far right uh, is the QAnon side and that whole subculture, you definitely, um, you're feeling like you're getting some vindication and something like progress after so many years of watching this kind of stuff with absolutely nothing. It seems like they're throwing us some bones out here and, uh, you know, possibly leading up to something like blood in the streets, you know, that's, but... I I am very jaded and skeptical because uh, well we've all been reading this stuff for so long and you very rarely see any titans fall you know you you get some sideline stuff guys like Epstein go away for two not long enough you know where they in my opinion it would there'd be nothing wrong with hanging the man by the neck until he was dead you know uh, if it all went through legally you know I, I I wouldn't have a problem with the death penalty for somebody like that but we don't ever see that at the high profile level you know. It was a massive cover-up. He had the best attorneys, Dershowitz, Black out of uh, Florida. And they not only were they successful in getting him off, but the way that the media held it, they had, in my opinion, I don't even have evidence, but the fact that the whole story was really not covered by the national media should elicit questions by people as to why a story that involved a rich guy trafficking kids from South America and flying around in jets to private islands and New York could not get a case. The federal case didn't involve anybody else. It was just Epstein. So any of his co-conspirators, whether it's Ghislaine Maxwell or anybody else who was involved in getting these kids, never saw any jail time is outrageous. It's a, it's a really incredible story. It's a very important. It's as, as important as the Franklin cover-up, if not more important. And uh, Makes yeah. well, so, It was so weird how like his... Uh, his um jail time he did do jail time technically but then they just let him out of jail for most of the time to do his job i think he showed up for an hour a day is my understanding i mean i've never even heard of that before that is weird oh yeah no he got a sweetheart deal he got something that was very it was kind of like the jesse smollett uh you know vacate that's another insider crazy response that's not even a clever cover-up like at least in the uh, Epstein case, he got something on paper where he had to do time. And Jesse Smollett, they're so clumsy, they just let him off in the entirety. And the backlash from that's going to be really problematic for Fox. And it goes all the way to Michelle Obama. That girl who was talking to uh, Fox was basically Michelle Obama's factotum for seven years. So, I mean, it's like, oh, that story's crazy. Anyway, it's good that you're right, just as your original point. The fact that at least some of the big malefactors are getting in trouble is a good thing. Do you know that uh, in a court documents, Virginia Roberts, a.k.a. Virginia Jufre, said that Dershowitz had sex with her six times? No. I didn't know that specifically. No. Yeah. So this is a guy involved in rape, in statutory rape, who's teaching at Harvard, supposedly, allegedly. How does that? I, can somebody explain that to me? What kind of bizarro reality that is? I, I just don't get it. Like she's making this allegation, and there was a second girl who came out and alleged that something like that happened. Well, and then, but he's still Dershowitz is still being interviewed on TV. And what's weird is he's he'll be interviewed about subjects similar to this, as though he could have an opinion about child trafficking or rape or any kind of me too related subject i mean how could it's, you interview him about that you know it's, it's off the charts it's so astonishing it's just hard it's hard to believe anyway yeah and i wonder anyway, like, actually uh just to interrupt sorry but if i put in the notes the two things response in opposition to motion to intervene de 550 i would encourage people to look that up and then also bainbridge's book was satan's power psychotherapy, whatever it was. That's what he wrote about process. The hardcover is selling for a very reasonable $257. Wow. Yeah, so... Yeah, because they don't want to... You guys want to set up a GoFundMe. You know, I'll <laughs> we can get one copy and we can all mail it to each other, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Dershowitz, if people don't know, I mean, Dershowitz has been involved in the, the positive... Uh, trying to put a positive spin and a positive image on... Um, sexual depravity all the way back to Deep Throat. 
I mean, if you know, I I got into looking a little closer at Dershowitz when him and um, the other famous Jewish professor got in their kind of media tiff. Um, I'm trying to think of the man's name. He eventually lost his tenure. He wrote a book, you know, that wasn't favorable towards Israel. I just can't think of his name. But I dug into it then. And he was uh, part and parcel of getting the whole deep throat thing going. Um, the whole, uh, who, uh, who's Larry Flint? You know, I, he, you know, he's just kind of like the, the long-term spokesman for... You know, for, for in my opinion, bad things, you know, depraved things. And like you guys just said, and you look just a little bit deeper, and these accusations are against him, not one time, but six times. And I'm sure there's way, way that's, a, that's what's officially, you know, documented against him. I'm sure the complaints against him are just as numerous as all the rest of these names, because they all have a very obvious problem controlling uh, and instead feeding their, you know, disgusting passions. That's the, it's becoming very clear that huge groups of very well-known wealthy people are all completely off the chain with their passions and it's coming out, it's being shouted from the rooftops that they're not okay and they've been feeding us media and information and appearing as if they're supposed to be something like a spokesperson or a role model and we're watching them all being ripped down, you know, like icon iconoclasm, you know, digital iconoclasm of these people. So, But what, what about the fact that the anti-movement here, the anti-child trafficking movement, the uh, awareness movement, where people are becoming aware that this is how the government is run by uh, these other, these secretive organizations that are setting people up to be blackmailed, with Excellent child point. prostitutes. Right. Okay, so the whole backlash movement that started basically with the uh, Clinton emails coming out and, you know, the QAnon movement has continued it. Okay, so these people all pin their hopes on Donald Trump. And why can't they find someone to pin their hopes on that hasn't hung out with Epstein? Right. Well, isn't that weird that he hung, he's his friend? Right. <laughs> I mean, well, what I mean Right, there's pictures of them together, right? Epstein oh, yeah. together, they're uh, within a mile of each other, Mar-a-Logo and Epstein. Trump has said Epstein is a good friend and he has a similar taste in beautiful women. <laughs> so very uh, suspicious things. I'm not saying Trump's blackmails, but I think that the entire thing that Epstein was involved with, part of it involved blackmail because when he got arrested, apparently like there used to be a bunch of like uh, videos and stuff like that. And the girls yeah. testified, they stated to uh, investigators that every time that they had relations with a man, he would debrief them. So Depstein would be there saying, tell me about what happened. What was yeah. his interests? How did that go? What was he like? Did he do any of this? Did he hurt you? You know, so that's like very suspicious. So, yeah, that, um, that's definitely the big yeah. money maker in, in having an underage brothel would be the blackmail factor. Absolutely. I mean, who's paying our people? You don't know who's getting paid under the service. There was actually a recent development in one of the cases where a John Doe came in and said they didn't want the names of the girls released anymore. They don't even know who this person is, but somebody uh, injected themselves into one of these cases. There were three cases. There's the original Epstein case against that was taken against him by the federal prosecutor Acosta, right? So that was settled or Arrange, the arrangement was made in 2008. Then there were two additional cases. One was Edwards versus Epstein that involved a statement Epstein made towards Edwards that Edwards sued Epstein about. That was actually just finalized in December of 2018. And then there's another case between Virginia Roberts, one of the vi vi alleged victims, and Ghislaine Maxwell, Robert Maxwell's daughter. We can go into Robert Maxwell who was a scoundrel in the UK, he actually once thought he was a rival of uh, Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch. So her, she, that was actually her, the relationship between Epstein and Elaine was how Epstein got social imprimatur is because Maxwell was in social elite circles. Anyway, the, the third case is between Virginia Roberts and Elaine Maxwell which I think is ongoing, which is what is inv has involved Cernovich and Dershowitz. But it's about, the, the primary issue is about 
uh, a misstatement by Ghislaine Maxwell to Roberts that said that she was lying. So she said she was lying, and so Robert sued her. And her lord lawyers, I mean, she got, I don't know who's talking to her, but she, like, hit the bullseye by getting the right lawyers involved. So there's people are in trouble. But anyway, there's three cases involved. I lost my train of thought, but I sent you, going back to your, your statement about um, Dershowitz being a sketchy guy going all the way back, there's a really good article I would suggest all of you read. It's Israel defender Alan Dershowitz has a long history attacking sex abuse victims, and I put that in the chat if you can share that. Thank you. Yeah, I think I first heard of Dershowitz because of uh, the Bill Clinton scandal. He was he, he he was someone they interviewed almost every night when that was happening with uh, Lewinsky. So right, I mean, but he goes back. What is it? He did the Von Bulow case where he supposedly killed his wife with an injection of. Was it adrenaline or something like that? Remember Von Bulow? He I don't. Him. Yeah, so Von Bulow was really how Dershowitz really got his start as a defense attorney. And Von Bulow killed his wife by, uh, so allegedly killed his wife by giving her an injection of, uh, what is it if you have diabetes? What's the stuff you have to take? Insulin. Insulin. So he gave her a high, super high dose, allegedly of insulin and killed her <laughs> and and, and Dev Dershowitz got him off and then he have obviously defended OJ and now he's yeah. defending Epstein so um, he's he's been in, associated with some very sketchy stuff And but you got to read this article it's interesting because he does attack these people um, I had a really good interview if you guys want to listen to it her name is Roberta Glass from True Crime Report and she actually went to this hearing and said Sit next to Dershowitz and all these people while she was there. Um, and this hearing was recent. It was within the last month. And uh, her commentary is interesting. But the court was used the term slut shaming because that's what they're that's what Cernovich and Dershowitz are being accused of is that they want the girls' names to do exactly what we, the the reason why the rationale why their names are uh, kept secret. Instead, they want to give him a hard time. Right, because so that's what the court's worried about. And the Castle, who was a superb lawyer with a Class A legal pedigree, is saying, well, we can just sit in court and make arrangements and, and uh, divulge what we want to divulge by still keeping things secret. So it's a very interesting development. But, uh, yeah, Robert yeah, Roberta Glass, you, True Crime Report, it's really interesting. I heard, I heard uh, not too... Too old uh, clip of you, and I know it's Ed Opperman, right? You, you, yeah. you, you kick it with Ed Opperman quite a bit, right? I am uh, his producer. I produce for his show, so really, oh, okay. all that job wow. entails is me getting him guests. Cool. Okay. So, what the the reason I brought him up is because a I I do like that Ed always uh, re interjects Trump into the whole thing because it seems like somehow he's got a pass, you know, which is the weirdest thing, like. They put him up in one type of media, legacy, lefty media, completely Satan incarnate, right? And you come over to the other side, and uh, it's like, just kind of keep it on the DL. But like what, his island is uh, a boat ride away or a short hop in a plane. Um, the yes. you know, There's all these connections, and uh, the main reason I thought, the reason Ed jumped into my head is because, for one, that man's an, an uh, he's a professional investigator, he's a P.I., Right? He's a licensed PI, correct? Right, he's a PI, and the way he describes the details, you can tell he's holding back a terrific amount of information because he can't say it. He's privy to a whole bunch of. You could just. I've, I have a lot of experience with people. You know, I could tell Ed's a cop or a retired cop or something just by the way he talks. So if not, he's been behind the scenes for a long time because he's got that wily veteran about him. And you can well, just. Well, I mean, to be it. honest with you, I think Ed does the best. I mean, in my opinion, Ed does the best investigative show on the internet better than even the better no well-known shows because he's getting information sent to him all the time yeah They're, he knows a lot more people than anything he talks about in public so he can vet stuff he knows stuff um yeah there's a lot more to the epstein case but you know trump uh i'm not a trump pure apologist i was happy that he won compared to somebody who was venal and corrupt like hillary clinton but he was in mixing within the group of the really the hyper elite, you know, for his whole life. 
Uh, he was born into wealth. He had wealth from his parents, and so those are the people that he associated with. He used to be friends with the Clintons, you know? Yeah. You can see in pictures together, him hanging out, joking around. So and I think he was actually a major donator to the Democratic Party. So he's not like a super rigid Republican, so, but that's their so classes. These, I mean, Epstein, I mean, some of these cases, if you look at some of these uh, videos from the Edwards case where they were giving press conferences, Epstein had like planes, trains, automobiles, like almost an army of transportation. He was going to New York. He was going to New Mexico, to his island in the uh, Caribbean, Miami. Like he was constantly moving, talking to people, inspiring people. I mean, there were, he had friends with, I mean, he was uh, arguably, at least Ed says that he was an uh, essential person working with the Clintons to set up the Clinton Foundation. So you had this kind of guy who was mixing it, mixing it up with really the elite. Do we know what, what he's doing now? Like, is he seen hanging out with people? Does he dare know. to show his face anywhere? I mean... I don't know. What's a good point? Because when he lost his suit um, in December, it was a super long suit with Edwards. He had his high-priced lawyer... Uh, they, the part of the judgment, my understanding was that he had to make an apology, but he had his lawyer read. He wrote it. His lawyer read it out. So I don't know what he's doing. I heard a rumor from one researcher that he bought another island for $20 million in um, the Caribbean. So I, I really don't know. I know that there's a lot of settlements and a lot of things under the surface that involve Boyce Flexner um, and the victims and um so there are a lot of things that haven't hit the courts, you know. These are just two, three of the cases that hit the courts, so there's a record. But that means that all these other cases that, you know, if there's a settlement, they're just kept quiet. So it was, in, it was interesting that uh, uh, Dershowitz came out of this hearing that was last month in New York at the district court. And he, I think he let it slip. He said that, I'm not I got to, well... Yeah. Anyway, he said he said something that I think was supposed to be uh, confidential information. So there's a lot of stuff going on with it's still going on with Epstein. So I don't know what he's up to. I really don't. You're not going to tell us what it is. Well, okay. Good? So the way that I read it. So when you go into a settlement, and you and this is the same for any of the general settlement is you sign all types of clauses and things like that that maintain its confidentiality. That's usually it, unless there's a special provision that this is supposed to be publicized with a number. You're not supposed to ever disclose the number. And in that, he had a, the guy's name was Goodman. He was a, kind of like a, a independent researcher, uh, activist, shoved the mic in his mouth, and I thought, could have swore. I'll have to look at it again. I may be wrong, but I could have swore Dershowitz said, Virginia Water Roberts settled these... Uh, Claims for over for multi million dollars, which um, you're not supposed to say. I mean, she could have got a one dollar settlement just to just to have something as that she was in the right. You know, there's all kinds of strange deals. Usually, it's obviously financial, but um, it was weird that he had said that. So hmm. um, that's my recollection. I'll have to. I'll have to yeah, he dropped he dropped dollar amounts, even if it's not exact amount. You know, saying. Oh yeah, she won a hundred million dollars as a huge deal. I mean, that puts a permanent target on your back, whether it's well, true anything, or not. Right. You know? So uh, yeah, he, he, you're definitely not supposed to disclose that. That's a violation of your, uh, you know, of the agreement, especially if he was in that civil case making that decision too. Yeah. As an attorney, so I don't even know who was his uh, civil litigator, who his civil attorneys were for those cases. I'm assuming it's Dershowitz, and just until recently, I think six months ago, Dershowitz still said he was. Jeffrey Epstein's attorney. So wow, really? Yes. Yeah. Wow. So we're getting a question in the chat here for William, um, whether or not, due to the nature of your uh, of your great work, your research, it says um, if you ever feel afraid or in fear of uh, repercussions. Um, I mean, I know it's a common thing in the conspiracy realm to, uh, you know, we all have our own degree or variants of hyper awareness of things going on. And I think that's a that's a pretty good question because this is pretty pretty current affair stuff. Current affairs always make me at least a little bit more. I, I don't want to say paranoid, but I'm definitely talking about things that are happening as we speak. Uh, well, I, I I don't really like quoting from Charles Manson, but one is more one of his more famous 
axioms was total paranoia is total awareness. <laughs> and I'm close to totally paranoid. <laughs> well, I, I, I think um, all of us in this uh, similar line of inquiry definitely if you don't Absolutely. have that then then you're not really looking around i guess your eyes aren't open all the way and i mean i will say a lot of people don't know my past when i was an attorney when i was going to law school in dc i worked for a guy by the name of john clark and i knew patrick knowlton for a summer and the reason those guys are important ed has interviewed both of them you can check them out on the opera report is that patrick knowlton was in fort marcy park the day that the body of Vince Fowler, Vince Foster was found. So he was the one who contradicted the public statement by saying that he saw somebody there. He saw somebody in the car and that he saw, it's been 25 years. It's been, uh, I think he saw that Vince Foster's car was there when they, the police said he wasn't there. So, John Clark represent and John Clark's still around. John Clark represented Knowlton, and that was an incredible case to work on. I was so young, 24, and um, there was very serious. Those guys were actually followed by dudes in briefcases, black backpacks, uh, high high intensity police cameras. And they actually have those pictures. Knowlton has the pictures of people who really were harassing him. It was a form of government, in my opinion, governmental harassment. And when I worked for John Clark, he had written some. It's very interesting because this was during the time of Lewinsky when uh, the, the Star Report was coming out. And the chief, uh, chief uh, researcher for the Star Report was Brett Kavanaugh. And the Clintons hate Brad Kavanaugh because of what he put in the footnotes of all the stuff that Bill Clinton, all the stuff that he was doing in the White House that they never wanted publicized and which was never publicized. And if you want to read about it, you can go upload the Star Report now and just, you know, type in the word anal and do a search. <laughs> uh, that's Brad Kavanaugh. But anyway, I was I was intrigued. I don't know why I said yes. But John Clark um, had me take this thing that was actually, you know, the, the, the springboard to the Supreme Court of the United States is the District Court of uh, District of Columbia, right? right? That's the federal court that Kavanaugh came from, that all these guys, Scalia. And John Clark was able to get this writer put in on, it wasn't the Star Report, there was another guy who, who supposedly was an independent investigator for the Vince Foster death. I can't remember his name, but the writer was an opposite of this other report. I can't, I can't remember the guy's name now. He was like a ex-FBI kind of guy. So Clark was very successful, and you can still read that. But I actually hand-delivered when I was 24. I walked through all of the halls of Congress, the senators and the House of Representatives, and, and hand-delivered this writer that explained really the real truth about Vince Foster being murdered and dumped in the um, in the Fort Marcy Park, and it was crazy. Like I handed things to all these senators personally, and so that just caused like grief for me for a long time. So I've yeah, always there's had... an answer to your question. There, I mean, I think you couldn't answer the question more fully than to say that yeah, when the the Vince Foster case was hot, I hand delivered the writer into the halls of Congress. Yes, uh, Bill Ramsey has a reason to be. Checking out all of his uh, over his shoulders at all times. Yes. Okay. That's, oh, I, can, wow, I just what can't story, even tell man. the stories. Actually, if I told the stories, it would discredit me. But like, um, <laughs> I, there was actually an interview I did with Keith Hansen. God bless him. I don't know what happened to Keith Hansen, but he was really one of the first kind of interviewers. Visigoth. Have you ever heard of Visigoth? Oh, that sounds familiar. I yeah, have. Yeah, okay, yeah, so I have. Visigoth. I did an interview with him. You can listen to it. In 2010 is 10 years ago, and I explained that whole story in detail. Cool. Okay. And uh, so, but there's the, the government functions in the United States a lot differently than the public really understands. So different people get into power. They control the FBI. They control the CIA. They control domestic stuff. The FBI, if they don't like you, it's not a good thing. It's not fun. So, you know, if somebody does something corrupting, corruptly and they have a corrupt FBI people, um, yeah, so uh, I would say for sure. I mean, what I do is extreme. What I do is extremely dangerous. 
It is. Uh, so no, I mean, I don't. I tell people if I get found in a bathroom with a red rope around my neck tied to the door post, I was murdered. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So uh, that makes me. Um, I haven't thought of this name for a long time, but you talking about that stuff must have stirred up my subconscious. Um, can you tell us? Do you know anything about um, Trafficant? Jim James Trafficant. Yeah, Jim yeah, Trafficant. Yeah, I remember James Trafficant. I remember uh, there was a lady named. Uh, she always they always called her Christian Attorney Linda Kennedy, and um, I well, I followed her work. Because I was obsessed with uh, a man named Peter Kawaja. I don't know if uh, if you've never heard that. Maybe I'll uh, I'll private message you later, and I'll point you in some directions that um, they tie into your work. But I remember um, Linda Kennedy saying that Traffic Camp was uh, given diesel therapy. That they just keep booking him flights and stuff when he was in the process of getting in. Um, all that. Uh, I don't remember what the charge was against him. It was all trumped up BS, in my opinion. I just don't remember it. But Diesel uh, therapy, huh? Yeah, yeah. Just flight after flight in handcuffs and never, like, get to jail and get booked in and then immediately have to leave again and all this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, man. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds correct. I think they got him on, like, um, really on nothing. I mean, compared to what some of these other guys do, I think he was taking money and, like, Fixing a fence in his house. I yeah, remember. yeah, it was nothing. There was a trumped up BS charge, but yeah, that's a shame. So here's the thing that I'd hand deliver. Let me see if I can find it. Star report. You gonna say something, Tracy? I was just gonna say I'm going to have to bail here uh, soon for, because I need to take care of my kid. Yep, no uh, problem. There, I put it in the show notes. If you want to read it from John Clark stuff, you can read it. It's it was in the star report. Now I remember. Okay. So it was the, the thing that he put in the Star Report. Cool. It was actually agreed upon by three district court judges. Like, these are the top of the legal uh, legal career. Let me see. see. Now, this is very interesting. This is like a piece of history. This goes back. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. I wish I could. Let me see if I can find that. Now, where you said where where did you say you uh, you dropped it at, Bill? I put it in the Zoom chat. Oh, Zoom okay, chat. yeah, Zoom chat. There we go. So, there's so many chats going on here. Yeah, this, this is. I had a lot of stuff is... on the Zoom chat. I don't know if you guys want to switch that around, but that's that's all the information they they put it. Let's see. Yeah, and like some of these people are friends with like Trump to this day. Christopher Ruddy, who was an investigator into the Vince Foster oh, no. death. Uh, as friends with Trump, I mean, all these, these guys are still around. Wow. Yeah, yeah you must be wow. surrounded by creeps if you're in in the uh, inside at all. And oh. I wonder what that's like. You know, <laughs> if you're not DC one. is very yeah. Sure. DC is really sure. it runs a lot differently than the public things that run. Things that run. It runs a lot of blackmail and information, dirt on each other. People are always trying to get dirt on each other. It's really that's, strange. That's so what seems see. to be coming out. It's like what used to be, you know, alluded to by authors of conspiracy books is now you can actually see them threatening each other on Twitter. You know, <laughs> it's amazing. They're out in the open about it. Yeah, it, yeah, it definitely seems like what we used to witness um, through, uh, I'd say, a better job of encoding and a better job of, of being subtle and hiding it. Like it would be exchanged over mainstream media and maybe in print media you'd see all this subtle interplay of threats and implications and finger shaking and blackmail bribery and now it's like tracy said like okay so if you're following the tweets and you know like the most basic crappy threat code you're like oh look at these people are at each other's throats over here so it's a i consider it all just a super acceleration so the quality and the subtlety has gone way down because now instead of having to articulate a plan to make a threat, you just go on Twitter and go ooga booga, and you know, and, and then it comes across really, really wonky. Seems like they used to do a lot better job of hiding their evil deeds than they do nowadays. Well, the social media is real trouble for them because they can really control. You know, there's a, what four the media is so concentrated in four big companies they can really just work with them, give them tax breaks. Uh, you know, one of the big ways they can control, which a lot of people don't know, is that the, the office of the president has, like, in, in addition to other budgets, 
they can apportion $700 million in anti-drug ads, right? And all of these educational ads to these, uh, you know, they literally pay the big networks just money. So if you're their pal, that's just your bottom line. That's just a free $200 million from the government. Do you think you're going to put that at risk? No. So all those ads at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's a really the way they, they operate and control from the top. Hey, uh, thank, William, thank you very much for coming on. I'm not wrapping up your interview. I'm not in control of the show here, but uh, I have to go. So it was very nice talking to you. And you've nice to talk to you a lot all. of great information. So thank you. Okay, we're going to give well, Tracy nice an person. early Good okay, bye. Good night. Thanks, Tracy. We'll, we'll be in touch. We'll, we'll hit you up here in a little while. We'll All right, see you. you know, and if you still want to, we, we're usually still on for at least another 30 minutes. If you want to kick it and stick around, Bill, I'm glad to just digress. And uh, you're, you're, I think I'm going to wrap up too, man. I think yep. I'm tired. tired. No, I, I see, I see it's like getting that. late. So we're, we're on the West Coast, so we're a little bit earlier. But uh, we can't thank you enough for coming on. We'd love to have you again sometime, folks. Please check out uh, William Ramsey and everything he's doing. Support his work, especially the smiley face killer stuff. Share that stuff out so that people who drink in bars and like to hang out are aware of the risk that they're Absolutely. in and get a look yeah, at this right. thing. Um, look at his stuff on the West Memphis 3 and all of the 9-11 Crowley stuff. Um, he's on Twitter. It's all in the description there. And uh, like yeah, anytime, I'll, links. I'll, I'll send you some. Uh, I'll, I'll, is email best, Bill, if I want to hit you up? Sure. Absolutely. Cool. You can okay. send it to... Uh, Cult investigations at gmail.com that's fun. Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll think over some of the stuff we talked about and I'll I'll be in touch. So and you guys awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. It was a pleasure. Yep. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Okay. All right, good night.